Are you kidding me with that? Your name literally starts with a K. Are you coming at me with that right? Okay, nah, Rucka, nah, nah, nah. I, Rucka, I, I like Ruckus, my, um, like Ruckus. Nah, I, I'm normally on the channel all the time, but um, I lost my certificate, so instead of <laughs> yep. K U R U K, it's a you know. Oh, okay. Us. All right. Fair enough. Yeah, I've I've been there too. I've been in the certificate. Well, you always accepted my pronunciation of your nickname. I'll answer to anything, really. Mate. K, I think you should go with K Rock. To be honest with you, that would be, you know, embracing well, the I K. Mean, he's the, I mean, he's the name of a freaking avatar, though, from ah, like, the Last Airbender. I see. So it's a reference that I'm just not aware of. Now it understands. No, now, now, yeah, I mean, now it understands. You've never seen the Last Airbender? Not the mo not the Shyamalan movie. No. But I'm talking about the anime. I have. I gotta be honest. I have a bit of an anime bias. I know it's bad, but I have a hard time because the lip sync is off. <laughs> no, no, this is American made. This oh, okay. Made in, in oh, okay. I know it's a dumb reason, and I feel bad for even saying it, but it's true. I just like I just watch it. And I'm like, ah. Uh, uh. Yeah, but this was made in the West. It cool. was made in All right. made in U.S. And All right. It's like huge on. Nickelodeon. All right, you're making me kind of want to watch it now. You're making me kind of want to watch also, it. Also, they're plan. I think they're planning on like doing an interim series. I well, they've been doing comic books ever since the. Uh, OG show and the sequel ended, so they're gonna do something where the middle of the story is complete, a little bit more complete. <laughs> I take it you're a fan, JJ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to just say really quickly before we go, uh, if you are watching the video, going, what am I seeing right now? This is the uncut, full live version of the Unplugged program. We are publishing this for the video for a little bit. Uh, the reasons, which have not yet been explained, but will become clear at some point in the future. We'll make it all obvious. The other thing you may notice if you're watching the video version, because we took a vote, we're back to the IRC room up on the video stream, irc.geekshed.net, pound, hashtag, Jupiter Broadcasting to get in on that business. That's like my upfront little disclaimer before we get going. So yeah, we're just setting up right now for the show. Um, we still need a pre-show. We still need a pre-show story. Did you ever, did you see anything? We could keep talking about Levi, but that's probably Levi. That's more of an uh, that's more of an unfiltered story. <laughs> Levi, the, the the action hero. Um, let's see. What do we want to talk about? Anybody got something? All right. I mean, you're gonna make me you're gonna make me force the topic if. Uh, well, if we it has nothing. to be open open source and it has to be Linux or something. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Be nice. Pre-show has slightly <clears throat> relaxed rules, let's say. The whole show is sort of slightly relaxed. That's true. Yeah. So extra, <laughs> extra relaxed, but not too relaxed. Wes and I got ourselves uh, a real Cadillac of a sandwich today. Mm. Mm. Toasted, and it's got pesto mayo. It's got melted Swiss turkey, ham, and bacon. And it's a toasted croissant, I should say, too, which is a key point. Butter, the croissant, which they make there in the bakery, too, which is also mm. a key point. That is a key point. Yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right about that. <sighs> yes. All right, well, we'll give people a... F this came out eight hours ago. What do you got? What is it? Hot, hot, JJ, hot off the news presses. Uh, JJ is breaking in with something big. Take it away, JJ. This is CNN Breaking News. Top open source rookies projects in 2018 by Ziff Davis-Net. I mean, that's pretty good, but it kind of feel like uh, I feel like maybe we oversold it with the breaking news there. Yeah. <laughs> it's only the pre-show, so don't worry. Uh, this can get cut out, right? Yeah, we'll cut all of this. There we go. <clears throat> That'll solve it. Hmm. I could pose it a question. Okay. Oh, oh, we have a question for mm. us. I'd love to hear a question. What is the you, uh, you a question for the whole class, or is it a question for Wes and I? Well, anyone. Uh, open source car. Things like the car firmware being open source. Not mm. like proper like Ford Focus type thing. Only saying this is because my car had an electrical fault. It's in the garage and it broke down 20 miles away from my house. So, <laughs> open source car all the way. Yeah, no kidding. You know, I know of, I'm I'm blanking on the name right now, but I know of a local Pacific Northwest maker shop that is trying to build an open source car and they sent me an invite to come down and check it out and I haven't taken them up on it yet but somebody is working on that and that you know did you see we covered it in Linux Action News this week that Eric Raymond is also spearheading an open source UPS project that needs to happen that needs to happen yeah that's a messy space the only thing I'm concerned about though is that these automotive companies are not 
fan like they're not like huge fans of open source unless it's widely supported such as uh, android uh, auto and uh sure and, uh, also, well yeah, he's so talking the whole car he's talking from the wheels to the wires and uh i don't think any large existing company is going to have a big incentive to do that it's going to have to take like the electric motors becoming kind of commonplace technology the battery and the chargers becoming commonplace technology 3d printing becoming more sophisticated and commonplace technology but we will get there and we will likely get there within our lifespans so the question I think is actually a good one to ask is once we have access to all of this common technology where it's approachable by prosumers, well, then what happens? And I think an open source car happens because people are already working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I'm just doubtful of it due to the industry that the auto, the auto, way the automotive industry is set up in my opinion, from what I can see from my vantage point. Plus, I don't think car junkies from their stereotypical, uh, no, not their stereotypical, but their um, sort of disgust at Priuses and other uh, geek-type cars. I'm not sure if that's uh, going to be good for the general uh, general. Um, oh, yeah. Share. I don't know how safe, it's safe they're going to be or if they're going to meet regulations or street legal. That's all a good point. Uh, okay, well, if we don't like this pre-show topic, we don't like any of the pre-show topics I've suggested, then I have but one. I've got one. Oh, what is it? Okay, good. You're going to save it because I, um, I thought I'd have to use the, it. The um, Uber accident that killed a pedestrian, yeah. I was really surprised how quickly the police gave a response to that. They gave, gave, well, me for last night, but they kind of said preliminarily, oh, I can't even say it, but... um was probably not the uber car's fault and probably a human might not have been able to um to uh, avoid the accident the the um lady walked out from a very dark um curb onto onto the road right in front of the car basically but there's all these um agencies that are going to check over all that and so the person was walking kind of yeah yeah and but that does happen right? right in front of the car yeah, uh, yeah, but that that is exactly the kind of situation that happens when you drive, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as... yeah, but still, shouldn't pedestrians know how to follow the rules as well? I'm not taking away the taking away the fact that the loss of life was terrible. No, don't get me wrong. However, uh, don't we have to follow the rules uh, as much as possible? Yeah, ideally, especially at night. Yep. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was yeah late at night. She came out of a dark area. The car was doing. 38 miles per hour didn't didn't even attempt to brake. The autonomous was driving it, didn't even attempt to brake um, before it hit her. And yeah, the police are saying, pro yeah, that it, it looks like the car might not be at fault. I well, guess yeah, in but some also ways. the car might have followed the rules as well. Like you usually stop at a crosswalk for people to walk through, and the car didn't see a crosswalk. Hence, do you have facial hair, JJ? Because I think your mic is uh, brushing it. Or something's brushing the mic. Maybe it might be a shirt. I'm not sure. Might be a shirt uh, right here. <clears throat> no, no, I don't hear it. Yeah, I, I think I was like, I think it, my mic was going underneath my arm. All right. Well, this has forced my hand. I have no option at this point. I'm going with the emergency pre-show topic. Initiating emergency pre-show topic sequence, ladies and gentlemen. Microsoft is delighted to announce Windows Server 2019 is going into full preview mode, and one of its headlining features is more Linux. What? Yeah, the improved and ready-to-go Windows subsystem for Linux will be moved up to the server series, and they're introducing a new type of virtual machine designed specifically to run Linux instances. They'll also be shipping it with OpenSSH, curl, tar, and other common Unix and Linux commands, all pre-built into the shiny new Windows Server 2019. Wow. There you go, Wes. I don't know how I feel about so, that. So, I mean, how long do you have to wait before you can spin one of these bad boys up, Chris? We'll just go grab the latest Ubuntu ISO and get started now, Wes. Oh! Hmm. Well, with this uh, stuff going up to the enter to the server version of Linux, this uh, beg begs the question that uh, Alan Jude might ask. When will the BSD subsystem come out? <laughs> oh, you think that's what he would say? Welcome to BSD Unplugged, your weekly BSD talk show that's too busy getting actual work done to care about what your silly display server. My name is Alan. I can hear delight in his voice I when sure he says can, that. Yeah. I can hear it. <sighs> He's totally not getting away with anything. 
Uh, all right, guys, let's uh, let's get started. Let's do the show. We may have a few more trickle in. Hello, Eric. Good to see you. Uh, we may have a few more folks trickle in here. Uh, yeah. All right. Windows Server coming at you. Welcome to the Windows Server Action Hour. <laughs> all right, Wes. Buckle up. Ooh, I'm already buckled. Oh. I'll double buckle. You're so safe. You know, no. you really are safe. Well, if it, everything <clears throat> else is unplugged, I figured I need some sort of restraint here. <laughs> well, do you have eyes on the dog? Is he uh, going to be a problem? Is he good? Is he looking at you or is he laying down? Well, now he's looking at me. Yeah, that's the thing. As soon as you pay him attention, he's good until you acknowledge his existence. I got to learn that better. All right, here, here we go. Prepare for dog jumpage. This is Linux Unplugged, episode 241. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly Linux talk show that's now recording in four individual stereo tracks. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello, Wes. Boy, do we have a heck of a show coming up today. So not only do I have a couple of select moments from scale, I went down and got 170 individual clips, and I'm playing one interview. That is choice. Hand selected, handcrafted, my favorite moment from my trip to scale. It's my first episode back. But before we get there, we have a huge batch of community news, uh, open source projects that are coming back, big desktop releases, some plumbing that's getting some major updates, and a cool trick to make Firefax. Firefax? Firefax. Do you have Firefax? Yeah, sure. It's all. It's in yeah. all my facts. It's the fact way. checking service that fire that checks Firefox facts. I don't. Everything is ruined. I don't know. Uh, actually, no. It's a trick to get more performance out of Firefox. That's all. I'm sorry. It's nothing more than that. Also, a pretty well known company is open sourcing all of the things. They just announced it today, and they're rolling it out. A handy firewall utility for the Linux desktop. A better way to stream Spotify on Linux. And then we'll wrap it all up with a couple of choice, choice app picks. That's solid, right? I wow, mean, I'm excited. That's a lot of show. Stop wasting our time. Let's get to Let's it, Chris. Get to but it. There's there, a couple of things. You're right. First of all, we got to say time-appropriate greetings to that mumble room. Hello, mumble. What's Hello. up? Hello. Hello. It's good, to, it's good to be with you guys. I missed you last week. So thank you for uh, thank you for hanging out with Noah and Wes while they did the show. And thank you to Noah for hosting. No kidding. And, of course, Ask Noah is coming up in just a little oh. bit. But did you see this story that we're going to start with this week? I mean, it just had to start with this story. LG has announced that they're reopen sourcing WebOS. You, you, let's, go, let's go back in time a little bit. You remember this? HP acquired Palm in 2010. And then there was this whole WebOS on the touchpad thing that was short-lived. And then around 2012 is when HP announced that they would publish the WebOS source code as open WebOS. WebOS was then acquired a little bit later on by LG Electronics, where they've actually been using it for a few, few for at least a few years now on smartphone TVs, IoT devices, and other LG devices. Like I, I actually saw it. Uh, I think on like a uh, like a CES fridge. Um, and LG has announced that they're going to work in cooperation with South Korean's government agency that's that's involved with um, technology to make WebOS a sustainable open platform that is available for an open connectivity architecture. They're looking to commercialize it as an open source platform. This is part of LG's announcement this morning. And it's up, it's up on GitHub, and uh, I think it's sort of a semi-quasi Android competitor. It's part of this play to just have a company offering a solution that isn't US-based, that isn't Google. Right, that seems like the main thing, otherwise it's it's all very still very veiled and enterprisey. You know, it, it doesn't seem really like, it's good that they're open source. That that part is great, but it doesn't feel like it's really, you know, there's not a great readme. There's a whole bunch of components. It really, it's not something we would use, but maybe you're right. Like, there'll be some vendors that think, okay. Yeah, it just won't die. It just won't go. And great. You know what? Mm -hmm. God bless it. I think that's wonderful. Good on them. Can't just, kill Linux. You just keep going. And, you know, we all have said, I mean, it's cliche to say, ah, oh, WebOS was one of the good ones. But it's <laughs> maybe this bears that out because... It just simply won't go away. Uh, and I I tried to get one of those touchpads. I tried to do this whole thing. It was a total waste of money. But uh, 
I have heard that their implementation on LG TVs is one of the better smart TV OSs out there. It is interesting going and looking through here, like Pulse Audio integrations, Wayland extensions for WebOS. Yeah, yeah, isn't that something? <laughs> WebOS won't die, Wes. It just won't die. Um, GNOME 3.28, also another big news item this week, incorporating 25,000 changes. Don't know how many of those are translations, but a lot of changes. And 838 contributions from our individual contributors make up the 3.28 release. And it's got a couple of features that I'm a huge fan of. First feature, it, it seems simple, but if you think about it, it's actually going to make working day to day really fast. The version of files in GNOME 3.28 now has a starred feature where you can star files. And then on the left hand places area, you go to starred, and it's just the files that you've starred. Now, this is great because they've taken away desktop icons, so it sort of comes at just the right time where you still have a kind of a workflow for quick access to files, and then when you're done with them, you just pop that star off. Um, but that's not the big feature. The one that I really like to see, and I can't wait to see where they're going to go next, is Boxes, the VM front end that is one of my favorites on Linux, now has the ability, using the new Box Assistant, to download ISOs that you want right off the web. So you want to try out... Tumbleweed to try out GNOME 3.2.8, you just click the thing, it'll pull it down right there. Wow, that's yeah. slick. Yeah, Debian testing's in there, NetBSD's in there. It's awesome. Kind of makes it, changes the the feel of it from a uh, somewhat of a, you know, not quite power tool, but helper tool when yeah. you already understand how the virtualization works to something a little more user-friendly. Totally, totally. So uh, that's the new Boxes feature, and the Photos app has gotten some updates. So new version of GNOME... I'm not running it. I did try it for a bit. You are, what are you running? Some sort of quasi hybrid plasma gnome setup over there? I do have both on here, yes. Which I one do. are you in right now? Right now it's gnome. I needed to test something uh, out on this side, but normally yeah. it's been plasma for the past <clears throat> couple weeks. The reason why I even knew that is because your machine's been running crazy hot all day as the Evolution data server has been losing its crap. So, <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's only a really, at this point in time, that we're recording a couple of choice ways to get. Uh, to get GNOME 328. Anybody in the mumble room by any chance actually on the new version of GNOME, GNOME 328? Like a Tumbleweed user in there by chance? I know, uh, I didn't think so. I've, I bet you if Gabriel was in there, he'd say yes. Um, but I've been pretty happy with Plasma. Just got a whole batch of updates installed today. So the, the Plasma adventure for me continues on, and I'm pretty happy with it. Levi, too. Levi the dog is pretty happy with it. There's also a feature in uh, GNOME 328 that Levi really likes. It's support for Thunderbolt 3 security models. And this is the accumulation of work that's being done, been done by Red Hat now um, for quite a while. I, I first saw Joey over at OMG Ubuntu report about it in, on December 14th, 2017. And it was a project called Bolt. And what it does is it adds some security protections around Thunderbolt devices. So unlike USB, Thunderbolt 3 allows a wide access to devices on your memory bus, on your PCI bus, just like FireWire did. So it's speculated that you could hook up a malicious Thunderbolt device. It actually, I don't know if it's been proven with Thunderbolt. I know it has with FireWire. But in theory, because it's the same essential technology as the way it's on the PCI bus, you, as you know, probably could hook up a device to Thunderbolt and you could read what's on the PCI bus lane, the PCI lanes, which is um, contents of memory, uh, the things that are being sent to the CPU. It's, it's like you're an I.O. port right on the PCI bus. And so to mitigate against malicious uses of this, there are Thunderbolt 3 security levels, which has been supported at the kernel level for quite a while, but as you're probably guessing right now, hasn't been implemented in user space. This is where Red Hat's Project Bolt stepped up. Their developers were working on this Project Bolt to clearly handle Thunderbolt security levels at the Linux desktop while keeping it user friendly. So what they've essentially done here is they've provided a DBus API to list all of the Thunderbolt devices, enroll them, which means authorize and then store which ones have been authorized in a local database, and then forget them when they've been removed so that way there's um, not like an error message all the time. And emit, and emit an alert to the user if a new device has been connected or when that device has been removed as well. And during the enrollment, devices can be said to automatically be authorized as soon as they're connected. And so there needed to be a way to communicate this that was at least somewhat agnostic, so they used Dbus. And now with GNOME 328, they've built in the front end to display all this information to the end user. So in GNOME 328, you'll click down on your status menu and you'll actually see 
uh, a bolt message, it, it'll it'll say something like scanning peripheral, uh, and you'll you see peripheral secure. You'll see messages now in the status menu when you hook up Thunderbolt 3 devices, and that's because of this work to create this Dbus API. And this is more and more important now that devices like laptops have these USB-C ports, which are also Thunderbolt devices, so it's a little gray now to the end user what they're actually plugging in. Yeah, this seems like a surprising case where a Linux desktop is actually kind of ahead of the curve. You know, these devices are only now sort of picking up steam. So it's great that we'll have this at least in one desktop integrated yeah. right away. Yeah, yep, yep, I agree. And that means it's going to land in the next version of Fedora, and it's already in Tumbleweed, and it means it's going to be in Ubuntu 18.04. Wow. So uh, that takes care of a large, low-hanging amount of GNOME fruit. So pretty happy to see that. And it's an example of kind of a behind-the-scenes project that Red Hat sort of is famously known for working on on the desktop, even though they don't make a ton of money on the desktop. You know what I mean? Like, this Bolt stuff and baking into GNOME is specifically to benefit the desktop. Right. I wonder, I mean, is that just enough? There's enough people at Red Hat, Red Hat who use GNOME on the desktop? And, I mean, if you're using USB or Thunderbolt 3 peripherals on your work laptop, you probably yeah. want them to be secure. Or it's possible that multi-billion dollar corporations play super long games and maybe they are seeding a garden that they hope in another five years or so is going to bear a kind of fruit that they can package up and start selling. I like that Possibly. Idea. Who knows? I mean, when you just look at some of the stuff like uh, uh, Bolt, which is a significant development, and Pipewire, which you guys talked about again last right. week, which is a significant amount of development, and again, specifically for the desktop. I, I Perhaps all these people at Red Hat, and I maybe maybe this is the case, actually. Perhaps they're all doing it on their free time. Perhaps it's not Red Hat financed. I don't know. Maybe, maybe somebody involved could let me know. But it leaves us on the outside sort of scratching our heads going, well, why is this company that doesn't generate revenue from the desktop expending quite a bit of development time. Right. I mean, like, obviously we're, we're happy about a lot of these things, yeah. but it does make you wonder, like, how keep sustainable it. is it? Will it keep happening? I well, hope so. It, it must be sustainable because they're doing more of it. It feels like it's right. it's not declining. It's increasing. Um, So I, I I would really like, where is it all? Where is it all going? Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Geek Dad signing off right there in the chat room. We're So, you know, we're back on the IRC for yes, this show. Yes, we are. And uh, I met Geek Dad. He, he, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing his story a little bit, but uh, he gets to come to scale. You know, he, he's a full-time dad, and he's one of those dads that works really hard at it. And he gets to come out to go to scale once a year, and he's been going for quite a while. And he, he was pretty fired up. He tracked me on the way down. We were going to try to meet up, but I was driving like a maniac, so it didn't work out. But when we got to scale, he created the Telegram group, got everybody organized. He went over and made the reservations at the Brazilian meat restaurant Ooh. for our, our nice evening meetup. I mean, just a super great guy. And so, uh, yeah, that's Geek Dad going on there. He's got to go pick up the kiddos. So if you want to join us live, we do this show on Tuesdays. Go to jblive.tv on a Tuesday, and you can get the specific time at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Whoop, whoop. I got my squeaky. We got to name the chair. Chat room, name, bang suggest titles, because I don't think you've given us a single title yet, and name my chair. What do we call it, the squeaky chair? Yeah, this is where you really make the difference in the show. Because it really does, you know, it makes a guest appearance in all the shows. It's the third host. It is the third host. And it's the best of them all, too. <laughs> I know. It's, and it knows it, So too. eloquent. It knows it, too. It, it, makes, it, makes us, it makes us do things. But we'll leave it at that. Let's take a moment and thank Ting for sponsoring the Unplugged program. Go to linux.ting.com. That's what my chair did. And that's how my chair pays just what it uses for mobile. It's $6 a month for your individual line. And then your usage on top of that. So, for example, if you're on Telegram or another messaging platform, you may not ever use or hardly use any text messages. I think legitimately now, the last text message I used was when Twitter wanted to give me one of their crappy two factors and made me sign in and they sent me a text message first. Ugh. One text message last month. Totally not worth paying for hundreds of text messages. I didn't make a phone call last month. I mean, I did make a couple of FaceTime calls, and I did use Telegram and Slack calling, but that's what I love about Ting, is that's how I prefer to communicate, so I pay for that stuff. Now, why? That's how I can have three phones and pay 40 bucks a month. It's $6 for the line, and then you just pay for what you use, however many minutes, messages, and megabytes. Nationwide coverage, no contracts, 
Ting's got you covered. They have CDMA and GSM. And if you want to just pick up a Ting SIM, it's $9. If you go to linux.ting.com, they'll take $25 off a device. And if you have a CDMA device or a GSM device that is compatible, just check their BYOD page. They'll give you $25 in service credit. It's, it's so nice. It's so nice. Like my favorite combo when I'm running Android is a Nexus or Pixel phone on the Ting network. It's this completely clean, nobody in between me and my phone. I get stock updates from Android. Ting has zero incentive to get involved in like reflashing my phone with a Ting experience. So they have no reason to slow down the updates. Yeah, but how will I get all my custom music from the Ting music store? Chris? Right. And of course, the Ting video streaming service. Oh, yeah. That has exclusive Ting content. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I hate that stuff. It's like you get to live in a parallel world yeah. where it all just makes sense. Yeah. And you don't hate yourself. Yeah. Where they had to do it right. That's what I love about it. Linux.ting.com. Support the show and get $25 in credit. Linux.ting.com. What do you guys say we take a moment, um, and uh, my chair really wants to share a story about the plumbing of our desktops. GStreamer is the framework that really just kept on chugging. I, I don't know. I mean, I, start, I first started talking about GStreamer back in the Lunduke days of Linux Action Show. I mean, it's been a really, really long wow. time that it came about, and I, I, I've, I have not seen many multimedia frameworks that have stayed relevant, and continue to get additional usage. So we just were talking about Pipewire. Pipewire is plugging into GStreamer. Like, it's something that they're actively developing for our Wayland future, and GStreamer is a big part of that. And so I thought, well, it's obviously still a relevant technology. Even us Plasma users use it. What's coming up? So the new version, a new major release came out this week, and it adds some pretty fundamental features that, uh, holy crap, is going to make live streaming JB shows a lot easier. But first of all is WebRTC support. Nice. Uh-huh. Baked into freaking GStreamer will be real-time audio and video streaming in and to and from web browsers. The whole pipeline now, from your browser down to your multimedia framework, is going to be WebRTC aware. I think that's a big deal. That's huge. Video for Linux support, including encoding support, stable element names, and faster device probing, which means things like OBS may be able to bring certain GStreamer devices in now. I think that's going to be really nice. I'm skipping a few other ones. RTSP 2.0 support, QuickTime Muxer support, a new uh, pre-fill recording mode that allows editors to import into Adobe Premiere and Final Cut Pro QuickTime files while they're still being written to. Which, think about that. Think about how fast those editors have to work if they're editing files that are still being written to. And then, uh, for you binary NVIDIA users, a new plugin for hardware accelerated vi uh, video decoding using the NVIDIA API. And back to live streaming, adaptive dash trick play support, which is also a big deal. There's also some G Streamer C sharp bindings that have made their way in there, and uh, some Rust bindings that uh, are now being baked in. The chair approves. It sure does. This is this is fancy, and I mean, there's like a lot. I, I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily use GStreamer directly unless they are doing some of this plumbing sure. or maybe involved in video production, audio production work. Yeah, you're watching you're watching a video or listening to an MP3. You don't have any thought about the back end of decoding that audio that's happening in GStreamer. But it really is. It's got its fingers everywhere. So these improvements can just be benefited. You know, anything that uses it and that uses the new release. Mm -hmm. Boom. And, and having a common API like this makes developing good multimedia applications on the Linux desktop possible because you have an API to develop against. And they're also releasing binaries for Android, iOS, Mac 10, and Windows in the next few days. Wow. Yeah. It makes it an actual viable like API to write against. iOS binaries. Fancy. I wonder like I wonder what that means. I wonder if that means like you bundle it in with your application. I would assume so, yeah. So in the back end you're using GStreamer and the user is none the wiser on an iPhone. That's awesome. We talked about Firefox fifty nine on Linux Action News this week. There's a few things that I really like about it. Their screenshot tool is actually getting pretty useful. Uh, let's let's you like mark it up now and copy it right to the clipboard, which is great for when you just want to drop it in Telegram. And um, they have some new blocking features, but none of that matters. None of that matters because it's not about making it much faster. Windows and Mac users got something that us Linux users didn't get this time around. And I, what? We can't have that. What? So we got to write that wrong. We get, we have got to write that wrong, right? There is this cool new feature called off main thread painting. 
much. You can just tell by the name you want that. I want it right now. It's not on the main thread, and it involves painting, which probably means drawing my thing. Slow. Yeah. Um, and on Linux, unfortunately, it has to be turned on manually. You go to, uh, what is it? Um, it's about colon config, and then search for layers.omtp.enabled and set that to true, which I did that um, about a day ago and haven't really had any problems. I don't know if I noticed any massive performance changes either. So I've, you're not getting the Linux Unplugged certified, uh, this is your, uh, your hack to make uh, kind of thing. This is just, you've been warned, you may or may not want to turn it on, but I seem to feel like it is worth it because so far I haven't had any noticeable downsides and there is documented benchmarks that show it is significantly faster when you draw the web page, web page off the main thread. It leaves the UI more responsive and other things like that. So seems like a no-brainer. My chair approves. I think Levi approves. I think he approves, yeah. We have a special in-guest dog this week who uh, has made Wes his, his friend. W Levi just decided this week that uh, this was the episode he wants to sit in Wes's lap. And uh, Wes... Wes thought he had a choice in the matter. I, I, yeah, I assumed I did, but nope, nope. <laughs> I am just a chair today. Studio Leva dog. is actually the co-host. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he missed you. Oh, you know, I we were in California too. and he missed you. So there's a company that I've bumped into a few times and you hear about them every now and then when it comes to, to funding. It's Private Internet Access. And uh, they've been uh, sponsoring several open source projects. And of course they run Linux uh, for their VPN infrastructure. And they're self-labeled longtime supporters of free and open source software. Well, today, they've started the process of open sourcing their software. And over the next six months, they're going to release all of the code for their client-side applications, as well as libraries and extensions, as open source. They go on to say they're extremely grateful to the free and open source software community for creating the foundations of the Internet as we know it. And while we may be late to the party, we are looking forward to furthering our work with a movement that aligns with our own passions on our own personal and professional levels. That I resonate wow, with me, yeah, actually. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I, I feel a lot of the same, same feels there. They say, we believe that the shift to open source is a right move for a privacy-focused business. Mm -hmm. Completely agree with that. And recognize that code transparency is key. We appreciate that our code may not be perfect, coming at it with a little bit of a humble mm -hmm. attitude, and we hope that the wider FOSS community will get involved, provide feedback, feature requests, bug fixes, and generally help provide a greater service to the wider privacy movement. Today, we're opening up the first of many repositories, the Chrome extension that allows our users to access our network of proxies from their web browser. The Chrome extension also boasts additional privacy and security features, such as disabling your microphone and camera, blocking flash, and IP discovery through WebRTC and it also can automatically block ads. Fancy. So they're opening that up. They also have a private internet access chat room on, uh, on Freenode, if you want to go to chat.freenode.net and go into private internet access for there. And they say, yeah, our long-term goal is to release all of our code into the open. That's fantastic. I mean, especially as a you know company that sells a service that's really just back-end infrastructure to run VPNs, it makes complete sense to be able to do this. And mm. so, to, to you know, of course their code's not perfect. It's always just been, been proprietary before. I'm, this is fantastic. And I'm sure it will get them more open source advocates oh, yeah. and users. I'm definitely going to take another look. JJ, have you, you've looked at private internet access before? Uh, I've uh, heard about it on various podcasts and stuff. My uh, question would be, how would they, uh, how would this uh, compare... Uh, Spec up versus uh, Proton VPN. Hmm. I don't know. I was thinking about. I wonder how it compares to Air VPN, which has been my VPN provider of choice for quite a while now, for a couple of years. Uh, which I was able to sign up anonymously using Bitcoin, and um, I've never provided them with a username or location. And they have a ton of servers to choose from, and they will generate open VPN profiles and all those things that I really like, but they're not open source. And um, I kind of think that that really is sort of a nice differentiator. And they're smart to identify that. It's very savvy to identify that as a differentiator for their market. Um, and uh, Duck Who in the chat room says he just subscribed yesterday. Either way, it's a good move. It's smart of them. Wes and I in the well, before the it's uh, our pre 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 show, I guess technically, because we weren't on the air yet. 
But Wes and I were just recently kind of discussing WireGuard, going back to Tink VPNs. You know, what do we want to do? We both have like a, we both kind of have a need for a VPN service, but we more like want to bridge lands together. So we're both kind of on the fence. Uh, I, I've been leaning more towards Tink myself. What about you? What, where did you fall down on that? You know, I, um, I've had, actually still have Tink deployed pretty successfully, uh, bridging some lands and, and that, but... Oh, you are still using it. I, I am. It's not as pervasive on my network as it once was, so now it's kind of just using that and not as much for the for the mesh functionality, which is why I really, I was thinking about replacing it. I've been thinking about giving WireGuard a more, uh, a more real try. Yeah, I've used it for some point-to-point point stuff, but uh, I thought it'd be fun to try to get a larger yeah. installation. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, anybody in the uh, Mumble Room got an active VPN account that they're pretty happy with a service that they like that works well with Linux? Has I And, you know, there's different needs, right? There's like... Very much so. There's rerouting to get around, say, region blocks, and then there is just trying to bridge land. So there's different uses, which I kind of have the former. That's what mine is. Right, yeah. Sometimes you need to... Go on. I have the most experience with OpenVPN, which is still working for me. Yeah. I have it set up on a VPS. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people in the audience do that, too. Hmm. Levi prefers that. Levi likes to just set it up on a DigitalOcean droplet in the London data center, and then he VPNs into that. That's that's Levi the dog's uh, trick. Isn't that Levi? Yeah, that's a good point. All right, Wes. Well, speaking of VPSs, let's let's talk about this really quick. <clears throat> DigitalOcean. Hmm. Oh. Oh, how perfect was that? Hmm. Hmm. It's almost like I didn't actually plan that. <laughs> I wish we were that savvy. I wish we planned the show to that level of a fine detail. First, we'll talk about VPSs, and then we'll get Mitt free to say that he runs his own VPS, <laughs> and then we'll segue. Nope. <clears throat> It's just because these things are very useful. That's why it comes up. Digital Ocean, it's simplicity at scale. And they have a very special offer for a limited time, hot off the presses. Right, that's the presses when people make those noises. Don't worry, they're open source presses. Don't that's right, worry. oh, absolutely. do.co slash unplugged. If you have a new account and you go to that URL, if you sign up for a new account and go to that URL, you can get a limited time $100 credit for 60 days. Oh, now, this is a great way to play around with DigitalOcean because everything on DigitalOcean is wicked fast. So you can go build a crazy, super powerful system or build something and just get that $100 like for the full 60 days. I mean, you could really just fine-tune it. They also have new flexible droplets, mix and match, depending on what your application Love needs. Love it. So, yeah, you could also play around with that. Uh, when, and I, I go to this all the time. Like, when I want to experiment with something, what I love about DigitalOcean is I'm able to think about who, who is the audience? Is it me? Is it the audience themselves? Is it somebody in an area where I could spin up the server in their location? Like That's what I love. Then there's this, tr this ability to transfer ownership. So after I've created it, I can give it off to somebody. We use that between Noah and I all the freaking time. It's really useful, especially when we just spin up infrastructure for like a on-location on, on gig. We use it for one weekend. And he has the image. He can send it over here. It's it's a super powerful system, and they have team accounts. So you have all of this great functionality, and they manage to deliver it all in a really easy-to-use dashboard. It's super straightforward for pros or beginners. A documented API, and then SSDs for everything. 40 gigabit connections coming into the hypervisors. Eight data centers all over the world. And for a limited time, a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash unplugged. I just waved the paper around. Uh, basically saying, uh, that's enough said right there. Enough said right there. But I will mention this, because this is boss-level stuff. You may have heard of Cloudflare. You may have heard of Nginx. And there's a possibility, a remote chance, you've heard of Ubuntu. What about putting all those things together? They have a guide on how to host a website using Cloudflare and Nginx on Ubuntu 16.04. So Cloudflare is a service that sits between the visitor and the website, and it's a CDN as well as DDoS mitigation. It's also a great way to do SSL acceleration if you have a whole bunch of domains and you want to put an SSL cert in front of all of it. It's a really handy service. Nginx is a very popular web server for a lot of good reasons. You combine all that stuff together, and they've got an awesome guide on how to do it. They've got really good stuff over there. do.co slash unplug. They also do a great job of supporting open source projects. So. Yeah, they do. Boom. In fact, if I could give them any recommendations, it would be maybe promote that a little more. I know they do it just because they want to give back, but there is some entire projects where their entire infrastructure runs on DO and they don't pay a cent, and it's pretty cool. So uh, are you familiar with the application for Mac OS called Little Snitch? Oh, yeah. I think I've seen some people using yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a handy little application that runs in the background, and it creates an outbound firewall. And it then gives the 
user some kind of notification, either through the native notification system or a, or a custom notification dialog, that XYZ application, uh, Chrome, is trying to connect outbound on this port to this address. Do you want to allow it? And one of the things that's interesting is, say you have software that checks uh, to, into some sort of remote server every time you launch it. You will discover it very quickly with yeah. applications like Little Snitch. And you'll discover, oh, every time I run Lightworks, it's checking in with edit share servers. Um, for better or for worse, but it's nice to know it's happening. And you can also make the decision to allow it or block it with Little Snitch. Um, and I've probably gotten over the years a handful of questions. Hey, is there anything like that for GNU slash Linux? Anybody got something like that? Because I, I would love to have something like that for GNU slash Linux. And I always say, get it out of here. Get it out of here. Right. You'll have to roll it yourself, do some IP tables commands and a yeah. whole bunch of scripting. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? We have an app pick for you this week. People have been saying, Chris, more app picks. Miss the app picks from Linux Action Show. Well, guess what? We've been slipping them in here. We just haven't been calling them app picks. But this week, we got two of them for you. And the first one is called Open Snitch. Open Snitch is a GNU slash Linux port of the Little Snitch application firewall. And just like its Mac cousin, it gives you a graphical notification saying, hey, uh, Telnet is trying to connect out on ports blah, blah, blah to uh, destination IP blah, blah, blah. Would you like to block this temporarily? Would you like to block this forever? Would you like to allow it? And the thing that's wonderful about this is you can just run it for short periods of time and get an idea of what your system is doing. And it's incredibly insightful. It, in my personal opinion, gets really obnoxious <laughs> after a while because everything you know is going outbound these days. Uh, when Little Snitch was first conceived, not nearly as many things connected out to the internet, but it's still very useful. It's called Open Snitch, opensnitch.io. And you're gonna have to build it if you're on one of the more common distros, except for Arch. Arch, there is an AUR entry. Surprise, surprise. But we're not talking anything major. They have... Um, <clears throat> The commands you can run to sudo apt install or dnf install the dependencies, and then it's really just a Python setup install. It's really not a big deal. So it's not like it's not like you're going to be spending all day getting the software built, and it is in the AUR if you want to just install opensnitch-git. Anyways, opensnitchd gets installed, and then there's a cute front end that talks to opensnitchd, and uh, then there's like a rule process, and it's kind of a nice system. It's an application level firewall, meaning it works while it's running, and it will detect and alert the user for everything, every single outgoing connection that gets created, which is very nice. It can be extremely effective to detect and block unwanted connections, um, which is also really helpful when you're just in certain situations and scenarios, maybe you're on a certain unknown network. Right, not trusted, or you're just trying to evaluate some new software. And we're, you know, it's using underlying good standard uh, Linux firewall stuff like I mean, like IP tables extensions or NFs or whatever whatever you have on your system it's it's not like it's some crazy homebrew Custom, firewall right yeah. yeah exactly it's just using the stuff in the Linux kernel and uh, once a connection is detected the software relies on F trace kernel extensions to track which PID is causing the connection so it'll tell you it can actually tell you which particular process on your Linux box is trying to make that outbound connection nice which it's really great when something comes like, I didn't even know that was running in the background. So that's uh, Open Snitch, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And then, Wes, you found this one. And I figured, well, why would you want this? But then I remembered that Spotify actually has this feature where any, other, any Spotify client can control any other Spotify yeah. client on your account. And that's when this next app pick really clicked for me. It's Spotify D, an open source Spotify client that runs as a Unix daemon. So just like regular Spotify, it's headless, it's headless freaking Spotify. It streams music just like the official client, but it's lightweight, doesn't have that whole web UI wrapper around it. Um, it supports the Spotify Connect protocol, which makes it just show up as any other Spotify device that you can control. The only downside is it does require a Spotify premium account. Yeah. Which I happen to have because we use it in the family quite a bit. Um, I'm not a proud Spotify user. I actually hem and hawed a little bit about yeah, putting this sure. in here because I know like a lot of people like Spotify. You know what I like about Spotify though? I always tell myself they're streaming the music using Og Vorbis. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, and they and at least they're at least you can play it on Linux. And we're in kind of an awkward situation, right? I mean, we we talk about Slack, we talk about other things. As much as we love and want to support open source software, 
you also, you know, we're all we all getting our lives done, and sometimes yeah. that means running whatever you happen to already have, or maybe you're sharing an account with your spouse or whatever else. I mean, the thing is, is not only do we have shared playlists, which was which is great, but uh, I just don't care enough about music. Like when when I when I first got a computer and CDs were still a thing, like I curated a collection, and I was really OCD about all of my tag information. And I would rip complete albums and make sure all of the stuff, and I'd run it through like Music Brains Picard yep. and all that kind yep. of stuff to try Meticulous. to make Meticulous. Yeah, and then you know, a couple of machine migrations, everything gets ruined. Or I I I'd try out a, a I'd, I'd install the new version of Rhythmbox, and it blanked out all of my ID3 tags one time. And I'm like, well, I'm never, <sighs> I'm never gonna do that again. And I just sort of had to just divorce myself from caring about my music collection. And now I just embrace the streaming service. And honest, honestly, if Spotify went out of business tomorrow, I would give zero shits. I would just sign up You'd for something else. To a different one. Yeah. yeah right. um, so it's with that kind of pragmatist mindset that I use Spotify. And so when you come at me with an open source Spotify headless client that I could potentially run here in the studio, I'm all about it. I think this is great. Yeah, especially if you already have like a media center machine that's hooked up to a sound system or otherwise. This totally. would be perfect. Totally. Yeah, that's great. It does require the also packages get installed, which then talks to Pulse, but that's a typical uh, shit show of Linux audio. Not too surprising there. It also supports DBus, which means it can be controlled by some generic media playback controllers like uh, Player CTL or your desktop environments that have like the playback controls in the volume slider, like modern desktops, still can control this sucker too. So you don't really need the Spotify client. Wow. See, this is awesome. So this might be just the way I get Spotify from now on, and uh, you may want to as well. You can find a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, that's true. Veritunda says in the chat room, he says, but Chris, that's what media servers are for, like MB. So I got, I got, a, I got an excuse for that too. I, I, uh, I, got, uh, I got all in on um, Sub-Zero, I think it was, or Subsonic. Subsonic, Subsonic yeah. And uh, there was a whole bunch of shenanigans about about them going commercial and the project had a bunch of bad blood and I paid for it like on two separate occasions and got screwed and so I mean it's it's not it's not a good enough reason but I just gave up. I still manage like my uh, my video collection like I used to manage my TV or my um my uh, my music collection. I still manage my TV and my movies like that. But mm-hmm. I gave up on the music a long time ago. It's just a it's just a shame. It's especially hard with discovery and other things too, and the, yeah, the streaming that are services online. just make it so simple. Yeah, yeah, that's just you, you sit down on the, especially with Android TV and stuff like that. I know anybody in the mumble room, the exact opposite, where like you're super meticulous about your music library, you only listen to local audio. You know, Angela's like that. Angela only listens to Is local. Is that right? No streaming. She's just local audio. She still syncs it via the wire to her this? phone. Yeah, impressive. Normally. Yeah. What's that, Minimax? I started, I started to back up my whole CD collection, which is about 400 or 500 CDs. Woo. I have a flag copy and then normally have uh, 192 OTG um, copies for my phone and for my router. So when hmm. I'm at home, I stream via router. So That works great. What, pl- what client are you using on Android to play Hogs? On Android, I don't have an Android phone. I use the Yola Selfish phone, oh. so there's no problem. Okay, okay, all right. Nice, <laughs> nice answer, dude. Yeah, <laughs> shut Chris up. And right I there. knew that too. I now that I think about it, I, I knew never it. Had that question? I, is is that true? Does Android don't? Uh, I don't. Have no, Android no. I mean, there's like VLC it's and whatnot. Default now. I don't. No, the the open source music media player. I don't think is even the default anymore. Um, but there are, I mean, I have a dozen different apps that will play OGS, but I don't like any of them enough to like listen to all my music that way. Right. Uh, so Isn't it interesting that it's hard to find a really good music player? I yeah. mean, there are thousands for Linux boxes, but a really good one? I found Lollipop for GDK GNOME, yeah. which is cool. Yeah. CMOS on the terminal is great. Yeah. But otherwise, it's really hard to find really cool, good music players. I, just I mean, most of us... I mean, most of us are satisfied with the results of VLC, I guess. Well, but what if you have a large collection? See, that's one of the other reasons I use end up using Spotify is because it's also a jukebox, like of the old style jukebox. Um, you know, you guys all know Armorock. Just like after years, just after years, just released a new version recently. Like a I didn't I, I missed that. Yeah, I don't know if it's a beta or what, but yeah. So it's still a thing, but. 
I, I think with SSDs too, and a lot of my main machines are laptops these days, I just don't have a lot of room for gigabytes and gigabytes of music. If I had a, a, a unlimited budget, unlimited time, I, I would prefer to have everything in Flax, and I would prefer to have it all local. But right, rolled rolled up some streaming of your own if you needed it. I know it would make Noah happy. Like MB, yeah, totally. <laughs> he, he drives me crazy how much I use that stuff. Uh, you know. Oh, you broke up a little bit there, Eric. S- send again. Oh. Send again. You're you're coming in now. Could tell you what I ended up doing. Oh yeah, what did you do? Because you're kind of in a limited connectivity situation. Yeah, exactly. Right now I'm on LTE, unfortunately. So. Um, we can tell you're on LTE. You're breaking up again. I feel your pain. Just give it a second. Give it a second. Let it breathe. You know, one of the problems with the LTE is it kind of comes and goes. Yeah. And then plus you're also yeah. in a double NAT situation when you're behind LTE typically. So say it again. Send it again, Eric. Okay. Oh, it's no good. It's no good. Well, try again in the post show. You'll have to tell us. You'll have to wait with bated breath what Eric's solution is for offline media. <gasps> Yeah, I guess I don't he think it's... He has to do it an offline uh, solution as well. Yeah, maybe he could record that offline and send it to us. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Eric. I'm sure it'll pick back up. before the post show. Yeah, you would probably pick it's up by the post show. Bad. Yeah, all it, it always is whenever you're trying to do anything production related. That's how it works. Right when you need it, you Trust don't me. have it. I know that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that one. Anyway, Spotify D will have a link up on the show notes. You know, if you want to give us an app or a story or a project that you think we should know about, hit us up on the subreddit. That's still going, linuxunplugged.reddit.com, linuxunplugged.reddit.com. And I don't think it's I don't think it's this week. Let me think. Uh, in the next, I'm not, I'm not sure what the scheduling is, but it's very soon there's going to be back-end changes for the RSS feeds and stuff like that coming to this show because we're doing a whole project. we got a whole project coming up, and this show is going to be rolled up into all of that. I don't think you'll have to do anything. I guess the one thing I would say is if by accident when we like forward the RSS feed, if we trigger an extra download or something like that, I apologize. We're sorry. Here's what I do expect to have happen. This is what I'm giving you the heads up. There will be a cleaning of the feeds simply because we're switching feed services. That's one of the things we're doing is we're migrating off of FeedBurner, which is sort of like this zombie Google service. <laughs> And uh, we're moving to a small shop that just is dedicated to hosting podcast RSS feeds called FeedPress. And uh, we're going to have a cool new uh, cool new URLs, too. So check this out. If you go to, they're not all set up, but this one is feed.jupiter.zone slash all shows. That is the all shows RSS feed Ooh. now. So we're going to have a new domain for all of our feeds, feed.jupiter.zone, and then slash feed name. So it'll be like all shows, LUP, you know. That's awesome. Super, super easy, easy stuff. to get yeah. to, yeah. Um, and the issue with that is that migration process is not super clean. I can forward, I can, I can do like a redirect. I can redirect people to the new feed, but I can't import the old items. Incompatible. So if you are an archivist, you got a few days maybe <laughs> to try to pull everything down in the feed. That's your warning because what's it'll be a reset clean feed and they'll be updated from there, but it, there'll be a, there's going to be a clean break when we move to the new feed service. You won't have to resub because I'll do a redirect at the URL level, but the actual items in the RSS feed will be reset. Um, and, uh, and that also will prevent triggering redownloads too. So it's... It's also a good thing. So yeah, there's your that's your but public. Be prepared for changes. Yeah, be prepared. Uh, also, kind of just keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. Just a general Linux unplugged service announcement for your bettered podcast experience. Now, uh, I did just get back from Scale, and like I said in the uh, intro, I got a lot of clips, over 170, and talked to a lot of people. But I knew when I came back from Scale this year that I really wanted to just kind of do the best job possible, just giving you what you need to know about the event and not overdoing it with 15 interviews and multiple episodes and all of that, like not bogging down the show with it. It's harder to do than it sounds like, though, because there's so much going on at scale. And so not so I got there. I got there on Thursday. I got there Wednesday, but the scale starts Thursday and it goes till Sunday. And there's stuff going on all day, every day. And you're learning and meeting people every single day. 
Plus, it's a multi-thousand dollar investment for us cost-wise as a company to go down there. And Noah's down there, and he's taking time off of Alta Speed, so it's a personal investment for him too. And it's a, so you, you, have this, you have this drive to come back and just make it all scale all the time because, you know, we've spent a lot of energy and time in this. Uh, but this trip was really the trip where I, um, I internalized why I go to these things. And it wasn't about, like, the pressure of making a show out of it. It was about going there, talking to people, learning, getting insights from the audience, uh, figuring out uh, new things to look into, like meeting new companies. That's why I went, not to come back with all of these interviews about the latest, craziest things that I saw on the expo floor. But I did pick one. I did pick one interview that I wanted to play with you, uh, play for you, with for you guys, because um, it's 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 from someone who uh, has been doing this for quite a while. He is one of the co-founders. He's the Scale Conference Chair. Elon is a longtime member of this community, and he works at Datadog. He is, a, as he puts it, a recovering sysadmin, huh. and uh, he had some interesting things to say. So I, I did pull that interview. I sat down with him at the expo floor while he was in the thick of things and just did a brain dump with him, and I wanted to play a little bit of that, a little bit of the expo floor for you, just to sort of cap off my trip to scale. So before we get there, I want to thank Linux Academy for sponsoring the show and making what we do possible and for creating a platform to help Linux users learn more about Linux. It's, it's a way to get access to advanced training tools that increase your skills and encourage critical thinking around everything related to Linux. A full featured training library with everything you need to know with full-time human beings that are available to help. And one of my favorite features is real hands-on labs and exercises. They deploy real environments, and then you take scenario-based labs on them, hands-on, from anywheres, at any times. Hands-on scenario-based labs give you experience on real environments that Linux Academy has curated for you. And that is huge for me because I genuinely learn by doing. Yeah, sometimes there's no, you can't supplant that. You can, you can answer all the multiple-choice questions yeah, you want, but if you haven't been on that server. And I can't, I can't test. Like, I can't test unless I've done it and I've seen it. I cannot test. There's no exam I'm passing. And I say that having learned that the really hard and expensive <laughs> way a couple of times. And that was just something I learned about myself. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about Linux Academy is it's built around that. But even more importantly, it's built for your busy, busy life. You can pick a course and set a time frame, and it'll fit your schedule and your learning goals. They have practice exams and quizzes to help you prep for when you're going to go take that test. And they have a community that's full of Jupyter Broadcasting members that are forking, customizing, and randomizing study flashcards to help you up your game. And then they have study tools that you can download offline and listen to. So if you're like Eric and I and you're in a bandwidth-limited environment, they can accommodate that too. And if you're on the go, maybe you're in the tube and you got some downtime while you're commuting, they got iOS and Android apps as well. It's pretty great. In fact, you might say it's the best. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. Go there, support the show, and sign up for a free seven-day trial. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. Doobly-loop, doobly loop So, yeah, let's uh, let's go to scale. You want to go back to California about a week ago? Um, let's tell travel. Get right yeah, there. Much faster than going by RV, right? Can much, we, much can faster. we still take Levi? <laughs> yeah, we're, de we're definitely taking Levi. You have to take Levi. He's the tour guide. Um, there was there was something that Scale has done, and they really refined it this year. It's not their first crack at it, but if you're going to Scale, I think it's one of the things you might really like, is they have these track sessions. So Ubicon, for example, was a track. It's all Ubuntu all the time. And then there was several other tracks. Like one of the more popular ones was the Postgres track for people that just wanted to implement and deploy Postgres in their day-to-day -day, day -day, like work lives. Uh, and so the goal here with partitioning is sort of Without having to do a lot of changes, you can implement this within Postgres on the same system and then get a lot of those benefits. One of the tracks that was going on all day yesterday and appears to be going on all day today is people that are trying to get work done with PostSQL, Postgres. Oh. And so this one is like a performance track. And this room, room 106, will be about Postgres all day long. And the other one that really blew my mind, Noah and I specifically want to go out and see like, how deep can we go into the underworkings of Linux? And so we set out to find the USB subsystems track. Uh, so the question is, is there a one-to-one -one course? That's like a hardcore session in there. They're like, people are following along, along on their laptops with the slides. It's like down to details. Yeah, they, it's, it's, yeah. 
like I, I started to get a little overwhelmed within a couple of minutes. But it's fascinating too, like the kind of stuff they have to worry about. It's a room full of people trying to figure out how to make accessories on Linux. And I'm glad there's people doing that so that people like you and me don't have to. No yeah, kidding. And you heard in the background, there's there's babies there, there's families there. Wow. There's even dogs there. They have, they said, you know, we could probably get Levi a pass. That's amazing. It really was pretty great. Uh, but Levi had other things to do that day. Um, and you get this sense that you could go there and really sort of walk away with um, knowledge to ship something. Like that USB subsystem one really went deep into like, here's how you troubleshoot when you're trying to build a product and you need it to identify itself to the Linux subsystem. Like, here's some of the things you can look into if this isn't working for you. Like, really like stuff you walk away with. Actually practical tips that you're going to need. Quote unquote actionable items, if you will. But of course, one of my favorite things of any conference we ever go to, because the energy is always high and people always have their best foot forward, is the Expo Hall. And Noah and I are walking around with our media badges, so we got to go in a little early. You can hear them uh, vacuuming the carpet now. They're still getting everything ready. We were able to sneak in as media a little early before the crowd's in here. And it's still this noisy in here, yeah. Yeah, there's the Ubuntu booth next to Chef. Howdy, howdy. Now this is more my speed. We got a Video Land booth, Datadog. I've been wanting to talk to Datadog. This is nice. Uh, the Expo Hall at scale is always really fantastic, and it looks like they've spread it back out again a little bit from what it was last year. There's Fedora. Hey, Fedora. Fedora's looking good. Fedora has a booth. Adobe has a booth. Ubuntu has a wow. booth. Yeah, really nice. Microsoft had a hell of a booth with Surface tablets there and lights everywhere and nice chairs. Um, Git had a booth. Like, lots of, lots of folks have booths. And then lots of companies that I didn't even recognize had booths. It's interesting how many of these company names I don't even recognize. I, I, think, I think a handful of these companies did not exist two years ago at scale. Oh yeah? I mean, do you recognize, do you recognize some of these like Twitslock, Skillydab, Tindy? I recognize GumGum. GoBot, Uncoded. I don't recognize these companies. I cover this stuff every day and I don't recognize these companies. It's like they've just, they've come up out of nowhere based on some of the technology that's in Linux now. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, startup companies and a lot of, you know, venture capitalist money that's coming around, people trying to get off the ground. Well, you just put it in a container yeah. and you can get funded. You know, we're joking about it, but that's kind of the reality is, is that some of the recent advancements that we've covered just as just topics of conversation in this show are now fundamental building blocks for entire businesses that are like getting VC funding yeah. and have a business model and they're using namespaces in the Linux kernel, right? Um, and it's not to say they're not legitimate because they are solving in some cases real business needs. It's just crazy walking around and seeing all these companies. I don't even recognize the name because traditionally going to these conferences for many years now, I've been going to these things even before JB when I was in high school, I started going, um, and that was an unfortunate long time ago. That was, and that back that was in the day, ago. there was you know it was a much more <laughs> limited spread. You had some big names. You had the people you expected to yeah. see. But well, that's wasn't... just it. You know, uh, so that was eighteen, nineteen years ago, and um, you saw you saw and through that time, really until just the last few years, it was company names you already knew. Every single company name you already knew. And now it's a whole bunch of new companies that are uh, even possible. They're like micro companies because of the technology that they're based on. So we were walking around the floor and we bumped into Elon, who is one of the co-chairs of Scale. Elon Rabinovich, uh, some of the conference chair for Scale and one of the co-founders. And I had a lot of things to talk to him about. We had a long-ranging conversation from what he think, where he thinks Linux is going in 2018. And I got the sense, you know, he said something to me that struck me, and that's what led to my next question. And he said... You know, the core team of us here at Scale, we take vacation at work so that way we can go to work and work harder than we even work. Right. And, and I'm watching him run around and I'm looking at his schedule and in one hour from our conversation, the Expo Hall opens up. One hour immediately after that, they need to be out there taking the wrap off of the food that's in the middle of the Expo Hall. One hour after that, he needs to make sure that the event in the, in the D room is so, you know, like he just has like all of this stuff he's doing. Plus, he was emailing back and forth with all of these companies, including Jupiter Broadcasting, months before the event even kicks off, which he's doing on his own personal time. 
And he doesn't take a profit from any of this. He doesn't make a buck off this thing. I mean, he gets community stature and he gets connections of and networking. But, but at the end of the day, he's doing it because he wants to and he loves it. Like, that's well, very I, impressive. I'm like, is it that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, so what is it? What drives you? Is this your contribution to open source instead of code? So, yeah, a lot of us... Um, are where we are in our careers because of our because of where open source because of how we were involved in open source in the early days. You know, my first first time I needed Linux, I needed to share a home internet connection, and I was like, oh, somebody told me about this IP tables thing and I, IP chains, sorry, at the time, and went to went to a local a local lug and got help from some some made a bunch of friends and they helped me at an install fest to like getting started in open source in Linux, right? Uh, and that was amazing. And then over the years, I thought, well, how do I you know, how do I give back? That, that like really kicked off my career and the career of a lot of folks here. Uh, and so being involved in community activities like this is, is one way of giving back. So whether it's the kids track that we run on, uh, on, on Saturdays where we have folks from six all the way up to 18 giving talks about how they use Linux and open source and sort of get the next generation excited about STEM. Uh, or it's the install, like we have a beginner Linux new, uh, new user Linux training that's a full day session where you come in at the start of the day with a, you know, basically it's a, organize, a more, um, more organized install fest uh, and we take you through, get your, get your systems installed, train you all the way up, or even just the regular talks that we have. Like all of these are ways that people can get trained up on Linux and open source and, and further their own career. Uh, we have a very popular jobs board and jobs bop and uh, you look around the room and most of the companies are recruiting in some way or another. So, yeah, it's, I think this is definitely a way to give back. Um, I would say, I would also say that participation in open source has done, whether it's with scale or with other things, has been very, very kind to me. Maybe I don't, you know, I don't, I don't take a salary from anything we do around scale or Texas Linux Fest or the other groups I'm involved with. But I would say I don't think I would have I've had any of my last two jobs if it wasn't for you know, having done, having built the skills and the uh, connections that I get to make as part of running something like this, so. And they really do hustle. Uh, that He mentioned in there really briefly the birds of a feather session. These boffs um, are also something that has become a more and more common element of these events. I really started seeing them become a common element in the BSD meetups. The BSD community started doing these, and I saw it kind of quickly spread from there to the Linux community. And one of the places I saw it actually come from BSD to the Linux community was at Linux Fest Northwest, surprisingly enough. And now almost all of these events are doing these boff sessions. And it's the idea is, I'll give you an example. So you might know Randall Schwartz from um, Floss Weekly on the Twit Network. He's there. And uh, he and I were uh, chatting and uh, we were talking about what else but Pearl and Dart. And so we started going back and forth about Pearl and Dart, and he started saying, yeah, you know what I'm doing is I'm doing a Birds of Feather session on Dart, so if you want to learn more, just come here, and we're just other people that are working on Dart, we're just getting together, and we're just hanging out and talking about Dart, and they sit around for two hours, and they build stuff, and they fix nice. stuff, and they debate stuff, and these are becoming more and more common. And uh, they're kind of a cool, unplanned aspect that's sort of organically grown up in these conferences that don't require like somebody to put together a whole stack of presentations and propose a letter where they recommend what they want to talk, where they suggest what they want to talk about and low, get accepted. It's just simple. Low maintenance, easy going. And you probably find some people who are actually, you know, just as passionate. There's so much to like at oh, these yeah. conferences. You can find zero in on some people who mm -hmm. are excited about what you are. Yeah, so it was nice, nice to go. I'm glad we went. It also makes me look forward to Linux Fest Northwest. We'll be there. We'll try to. We're thinking about maybe trying to do a live show from there. We're kind of getting all of that, uh, all that kind of worked out still. But uh, yeah, I really, I really had a great time, and um, it did seem like they were definitely trying to make a contribution back to open source doing that. So many things to, so many events to go to every year, and I understand not everybody can go, and not everybody has an excuse to go like I do. Uh, but if you can make it, it will sort of change. Uh, it'll change you a little bit. It really reifies what the what the community is. You know, we spend so much time on on all these open source apps around IRC, and all of that's awesome. But seeing people face to face and getting the sense of just how excited they are and how nice everyone is, it, it's totally different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How and face the disembodied voice. There we yeah, go. it is. You know, it is like uh, like it's it's like you get to check in with people. Like you know, William's often in the uh, mumble room, and William was there, so we got to hang out with William. He got to hang out with Levi. William got to hang out with Levi that's as well. Awesome. Yeah, he was Levi approved, as a matter of fact. Oh. Uh, so that's always pretty good, you know. Put names to faces like Geek Dad in the chat room, um, and yeah, and it just is a it's a it's a rare chance to get to talk to a bunch of like minded folks about stuff that everybody's really excited about, and you get to do it without the internet drama or the internet angst that all conversations seem to have now online. Now, all of that's gone when you talk when you meet somebody in person. You know, like my my favorite story I've shared it before is. Uh, 
Ryan, who tech helper, he's known as tech helper. And uh, he was um, not my biggest fan initially. And we met up in person and we, we became friends. And two years ago, he let me borrow his Cadillac when we went to scale. So that way I had transportation because I brought Lady Jupes and I had to park it away from the conference. And this year, I just without even asking him, because I was just crazy busy, I was doing all this stuff, without even saying a word, the guy sends me a telegram out of the blue and says, hey, would you like to borrow my car again? That's wild. And it's like, you know, wow. you go from somebody who's like, yeah, kind of a troll, to now like, hey, would you like to borrow my car? Because we meet in person. And I guess I just, I can't put enough emphasis on this on this one really kind of cliche point, and that is, Meeting people in person is completely, totally different than meeting them online. Online, we have these we have these two-dimensional personas that we put out there, and then we, we interact with these two-dimensional personas. When I first started getting on the internet, um, and you had to dial up and connect to it, you, you, you connected with a, a handle, a name, a screen name, or a nickname. And so nothing had my name attached to it and nothing had your name attached to it. And so things just weren't quite as serious because it wasn't coming from a real person with their name and identity attached to it. It was from some anonymous douchebag on the Internet. And so it didn't quite matter as much. But now with social networking and all the other all these other platforms, we're all using our real names. We all have our real faces on there. And so now it's Chris Fisher and Donald Trump. It's like these real people that are making these statements on these. And so we take these statements so much more seriously. But there's still these two dimensional, low context, low information statements that we interpret so much and trigger our own emotional baggage. And it creates this total hostile dialogue online. And then you add in the total dumpster fuel fire that is clickbait journalism and uh, ad based uh, clicks that just really make for a horrible, horrible, hostile discussion online, and you just bypass all of that when you meet up with person people in person. You all of you just all that baggage is gone, and it's just. Wait, are you saying you don't take seriously Captain Snorlax? <laughs> no, that's one person you always take seriously. <laughs> okay. <cool. laughs> Says the guy with the handle called Rotten. <laughs> yeah. Or my nickname. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, although one person I always take quite seriously is Popey. Hello, Popey. Hello. I, it's good to see How you. Are you. Good, good. We missed you. We missed you. It's, I, I, I missed you at scale, but um, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. yeah Sorry, I, I could make it. I may be. I may be hanging out with your better half soon, though. So that'll be good. That'll be fun. Yeah, I'm tracking his flight. He's nearly landed. He's not. Gonna, he's going to be there soon. So that's not confidential. We can. We can say that uh, he's. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. He's yeah Wimpy's like, landing in Seattle yeah. probably in the next few minutes. Actually, that's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. We're. Not, I don't think he's going to be too busy to come on the show. But I'm going to try to run down there and buy him a beer at least because or or ten because you know how often does Popey or Wimpy actually make it to our area? Well, it turns out more often than you'd expect <laughs> recently. Yeah, twice, twice in the last month. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly. <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> But, but, and that's probably just, you know, a limited time thing. So I got to take advantage of it while we can. Um, yeah. Well, Poby, you have anything to share with the class before we get out of here today? I was just about to wrap this thing up. Uh, Michael Sunnell Rotten is a lovely person. That's all I've got to share. Okay. Wow. I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. agree. Oh, hey, actually, uh, Ubuntu Podcast is back. <laughs> Could share that. Do a little plug skis. Ubuntu Podcast returned and just had Will Cook on the show. That's, yes, we did. That's something. We, uh, we discussed um, the uh, things that are happening for 1804, uh, some of the decisions that were made and some of the controversial things that people have been talking about on the internet. Uh, we discussed that in episode two. And turns out, episode three and four, we just had Michael Turnell on. Oh, wow. I see. It's a circle of plugs there. Oh. <laughs> a circle of podcasts. Yeah, right? Yeah. Well, good. That's awesome. I look forward to hearing that. And the nice thing is, is uh, you know, there's a pretty good chance then when, when uh, producer Michael goes on, he's going to have good audio. So that's nice, too. I always appreciate I typically, that. I typically do, yes. Yeah, you do. Oh, oh. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, I don't have a soundboard with a ding in it, but I would. If I did, I would. There we go. You just got to get a bell. There it is. I'll just get you a bell. I should just get Nothing you Nothing beats the hard copy. Yeah. <laughs> I do like having the physical bell right here. And so do the kids. It's a hit with the kids when they come into the studio. They always got to play with Dad's bell. Wait a minute. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get out of here while we still can, because I just think that I just went in a bad direction. You guys, thank you very much for being here. We'd love to have you join us in the Mumble Room. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for when we do this here show live, because uh, it's true. 
it's a live production. It's one of the few, so why not get in while yeah, it's still savor live? Savor it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you can get more Mumble information if you go on irc.geekshed.net. Do bang Mumble, and it'll give you the server information so you can hang out in our virtual lug. You can submit content ideas to linuxunplug.reddit.com. And, of course, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact and keep an eye out for those feed changes. Maybe new things coming. A lot's happening. And just a few more episodes of Tech Talk Today for Season 1, Tech Talk Today, And go get more Wes and Chris, techsnap.systems. See you next week. Bye. is currently traveling 536 miles per hour with a Wi-Fi connection. Isn't that amazing? He's had a he's had a decent-ish connection this whole flight because I've seen him in Telegram the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so I know he's got at least some Wi-Fi. Uh, I like the time to live. Yeah, it really Whoa. is. This is pretty great. And look at this. And you can. I wonder how expensive. Yeah, and I wonder how expensive that Wi-Fi is too. Look at this. You can retrace the whole flight. Oh, that is neat. This is great. That is really cool. There's a little bit where they estimated where the flight was, where apparently Wimpy went offline for a bit, and then he reconnects as he comes in over Canada. <laughs> hey, how's my audio now? Much better. So what were you trying to tell us earlier? Well, I was trying to tell you um, what I ended up doing, because I have, like, bookshelves full of CDs. When I downsized to the trailer, I had to put all of that in storage, so I put it all in a, in a tub, basically a, a <laughs> tote. But before I did... I ripped everything onto a one terabyte hard drive, which is being st mm. I can stream from Plex. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about so Plex. That's, yeah, that's the direction I went, but so, I hardly ever use it because I use Spotify all the time. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, oh. yeah. What are you gonna that say, that old story? Oh no, you know, if there's a reason to repair all of your CDs and stuff, is legitimately to try to get software to re do gender recognition and actually try to yeah, that would be nice choices for you. There's yeah. actually a piece of open source software which I've been using suffice the music for you and uh, trying to make it so that it can become a recommendation system for new music. So that I'll would be so let cool. The go to YouTube. Yeah, you know, I won't I won't lie. Uh, you've honed in on one of the things that I do kind of use these services for is to find me new music because because I don't really put a very high priority on music. I also am not like actively discovering new music like I used to. And so mm -hmm. the fact that these things have some kind of algorithm to try to surface music is is nice. jbtitles.com uh, Last FM does that pretty well. Yeah, so yeah. You, and so does Pandora. I mean, they all kind of... If kinda... you start to, to, to put your music list on, on Last FM, you yeah. normally get good recommendations. You just have to squabble your music. I yeah. wish it was okay. normally... Back in a few. Okay. Import like a list or something. That would be great. Because I don't, I don't like listening to the streaming services. I'd rather have it on... I'd rather have local media and then straight here, here give me some jet suggestions off of this list of yeah artists. boy wouldn't awesome. that, wouldn't it be great and to have so much thing. yeah if if you are if you really enjoy listening to music and really hate when you get interrupted at least keep you know some of them locally because there's always going to be that one oh absolutely where you're going to be absolutely bored of not having local stuff. Yeah. If you'd like to have 30 minutes of, not, of no ads, <laughs> just yeah. watch this video. Seriously. Yeah. Watch, like, it's a 30 second ad to get you to watch another ad. Like, ugh. The other thing about the streaming services that's sort of like a, a, a sucky secondary first world problem is it's kind of like a shit show, like how they all integrate with different devices and like TV set top boxes, lady tubes. Uh, all these different things, like some of them work with Spotify if you use this particular incantation. Some of them work with Google Music. Some of them work with Pandora. Some of them work with Amazon streaming music if you use a different incantation. Like, there's, it's really kind of all over the place. It's really, right now. yeah, right. By the way, Chris. Yeah. I'm not sure if you want this. I can link you to the to the project I was talking about, the general recognition project. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. If that's the thing, I'd like oh. to see it. Put it in the, if you don't mind, yeah. toss it in the IRC so that other other guys can see it. Sure. Too.
By the way, related topic in regards to Linux, well, Linux on mobile being Android at the moment, what do you think Android P is going to be? Well, it sounds like it's so far a UI overhaul, uh, a lot of small UI no, overhaul I mean elements. Name. Did you guys notice oh. that the, all the UI elements are basically Fuchsia OS? Yes. Yeah. 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 I thought that I had that same, I had that same thought. Um, oh, name? In stratum. Uh, what what's what's something that P? I bet it's gonna be not a sweetie. I think it's gonna be like a healthy thing. I think they're oh. gonna be the laziest thing ever. Pancreas. Because uh, no, all of their all of their stuff has been desserts or pastries. It's just gonna be pastry. Oh, they just no. call it Android pastry. That hmm. won't. That, no, no, that's too generic. That well, wouldn't be I, Google. I would, I think they're gonna I drop the so. sweets parfait. Parfait is also I really like good. That's no, that's that's good. Or peppermint. I'm going to say pudding because... <laughs> oh, pudding's good. I hope it's Android pudding. pudding. <laughs> Android pudding. Ooh, <laughs> no, but still, but still, here. it's Here's like the reasoning behind it because last, to, last few ones were nougat yeah? and Oreo. That's true. Both of them have different, have regional variances of that dessert. Hmm. And Google's trying to be more inclusive of other regional variances. And during an interview, when Sundar, before Sundar Pichai became head of Google, when he was talking to a few Indian students, he talked about, um, he talked, uh, they were talking, they were talking about, you know, why aren't there, Indi why aren't there Indian desserts being used for the names of these, uh, code names of these Android, um, Android, uh, Android OS code name. So, uh, Sundar just uh, off the top of his head said, uh, "Well, it's so I sort of want to ask my mom if I can use. Uh, well, there's Indian pudding called Paisam, which is also called Kheer. Uh, so th uh, that's my reasoning behind it. Hmm. We'll have to wait and see. I mean, I don't. You guys, think, you guys are giving it more thought than I have. Go ahead. Bob. My vote is for Professor Rolls. <laughs> <laughs> In the UK, are colloquially called nuns' farts. <laughs> Naturally. Naturally, of course. Yeah, yep, that's it right there. That's limited to just the UK, isn't it? Or nun farts? Well, no. Profiteroles. No, or nuns farts. Nun farts <laughs> happen around the world. Profiteroles. It has to be like a worldwide thing, and I would say pudding no, would be. No, it really no, doesn't. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. it doesn't. Ice cream or... sandwich is a very much an American thing. Oh, really? You yeah. don't have an ice cream sandwich no. over there? We do not have ice cream sandwich. It's not a British thing at all. Well, I mean, this is a recent yeah. thing with since nougat. Well, I mean, that's only two, so it's like one's a brand. Ice so. cream sandwiches are a really good thing, though. You should get an ice cream sandwich. Yeah, let's all go out you should and get, get some ice cream sandwiches. Yeah, really. And and peanut butter cups. Yes. Yeah, but Oreos have different... Uh, there are some Oreos that are, like, different across the world. Like, you can only get green tea Oreos in <laughs> Japan unless you go to an import shop. <laughs> yeah, but it's not called green tea Oreos. It's just Oreos. It's JJ, just, you were, yeah. JJ, you were dialed into the Oreo scene, my friend. <laughs> Well, that's because they're. That's because on uh, AAA, I'm. I'm a, also a ch uh, chat room user on the Twit network, and AA is. Uh, mm. uh, AAA is uh, doing a tasting of Oreos every single episode, but they only show it at the end of the actual live stream. Well, at the live stream they do it at the beginning, but they delay it at the end so that people who want to skip the segment can skip the segment and still watch the whole show. Yeah, because it does, so, doesn't necessarily sorry. sound like compelling podcasting. We still, by the way, nobody is voting, you bastards. JBTitles.com. Nobody is voting. Also, Froyo, not a thing. Hmm. Yeah, that's not even a thing. Yeah. That's, just, that's a shorten of another thing. Yeah, we don't call exactly. it Froyo either. We could just keep it at P, and that would be good. But ice cream sandwiches, I feel like, should be imported. That's that's worth doing. Those are decent. Those are decent. Well, that'd be a, ver that'd be a very kind expensive of ice cream import. You're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> would be an expensive. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll ask Wimpy to bring one back for me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there we go. Well, it'll probably melt on the way there. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the joke. Get a uh, cooler. Snitching on scale is our. Only title that has any boats because nobody cares about uh, my 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 problems. Uh, Deja Vu Web OS. The vote. Deja Vu Web OS isn't bad. I do like snitching on scale the most because like what? I love Web OS. It's so great. It's so great that oh it's coming God, back. Oh God, get over Web OS. No, no. <laughs> it, it, for some I reason, love Web OS. Popey, yeah, it was my reason. it was my lead story. I was like, I started the episode with with Web OS because I'm like, I cannot believe it's still yeah, here. Right. What about the the chair and the hair? There we, we go. Has the, the title. chair and the hair. We, to we totally oh, that's... saved you from having Michael Tunnell go on and on and on about WebOS. So you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you're 
<laughs> I can take. I can talk an hour just on webOS for oh, sure. Man. Waxing poetically about it. <laughs> oh, I still well, have my phone I free. I, st- I still have it. On oh, my you shelf, do. And it is. It's beautiful. It's just sits that's there amazing. And it just shines in glory. That's awesome. That's good. But the hair in the chair is. The other day I booted. Although, isn't there a host work. veto on this on the title? Hmm. Huh? Isn't there like a host veto on the title? Like, even though even though a title may be voted up the most. You, the host can veto. Oh yeah, I, I could still say nay. Yeah, ultimate power. I mean, so I think Dubstep. I think Dubstep. Voting. No, 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 no. People still vote. That's always been the case. Dubstep Allen has gotten voted up a million times, and we were actually didn't we pick it? Did we pick it for the final? Did no, we fi- it was the one. The last time Allen was on it. I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. The third chair is not bad. Snitching at scale. Snitching on scale. The chair in the hair. Um, I like all those. I um said window wiper just because that's the noise your chair sounds like, like a yeah, uh, oh yeah, squeaky, squeaky yeah. thing over glass. The chair not broken. I quite like snitching on scale because it kind of sounds like you're you're snitching about something. Like I like that. It's yeah. It's, it's, it's a little drama in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Levi action show. Oh. That's what it was behind the scenes. That's for sure. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. <laughs> now my lap is so cold. I know. He moved on. He like got after we started turning him down, he like he just moved on and now it's like now it's boring. I'll tell you what, how about doing WebOS on Pixel Two question mark? Yeah. There because you the go. answer is no. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you put a question mark on it, so yeah. it's good. Exactly. It's fine. <laughs> that's how titles work. I feel as if, I feel as if the WebOS is LG's Tizen though. Yeah. No, it's a zombie. No, it's a zombie. WebOS is WebOS has potential and has already been per, been utilized by people who realize its glory. So it's okay that in the future it'll be even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but at the moment LG is currently in charge. Don't burst my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> That's my job. I'm supposed to balance you out. Yeah, right. Uh, fine, fine. <laughs> I'm I am like when I first thought about it, I was like, oh, that's great. Okay, okay. I think it's it could be, be great. It, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe it will. Ah, uh, so uh, I don't see uh, I don't see old Noah, uh, but I believe the Ask Noah show is uh, coming up here in a little bit. He's got a bit of a particular predicament because his studio got tore apart on him today. But oh, uh, so he's probably running around trying to find a spot to record yeah, this right? shit. <laughs> oh. At this rate, Wimpy's going to arrive before Noah does. Yeah, really. Oh, probably. Do, oh. 11 minutes till landing. So he left at 1 p.m. our time and is arriving at 3 p.m., 3.45 no, our time. he left 1.30 UK time. Uh, how does that work? That doesn't... Because it's time zone. Yeah, seven, how does that work? Seven hours, yeah. I know. I just It's so crazy to me. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Like, it's just so weird that we just put up with that crap. I can't even. I mean, it's be- actually the best process. The, the the daylight savings times. That stuff is stupid. Yeah. The time zone system. I, You're on I'm, board. I'm no. I'm so nerdy. I looked into why they exist, and there's a documentary that explains it, and it's awesome. Oh, really? It used, it, it used to be incredibly confusing, and this one guy spent 20 years trying to convince people to use the time zone system, and after they finally did, they realized it was. Way better. Beyond, it was like ridiculous. Like there yeah, they used to who be confused, like from just cities apart from each other, and had yeah, no idea. It used to be separate uh, towns would be like two minutes apart. It would be based yeah. on the train. Yeah, system. that is crazy. So, oh, I did hear that. It worse. It was worse because each city had their own time. Each train system had their own time, and every time you train, you change trains, you get a different time. And the guy, the guy who was like doing the documentary said, "It's you'd have to be a mathematician to figure out what time it is at any point." Hmm. Well, but do like, so do you think you would know like what time when it, you arrive in a place? Do you ever think you would that, never know? Oh no, you would there never was know a, what their no, time was. You would because there were books that had printed timetables. That's where the term timetable Woo! comes from. They had timetables in that you would carry around with you. Oh boy! Um, if if, do if you ever the think, particular city had their own convenient. timetables, sometimes they didn't. Like, that sounds awful. Like crazy. How, do you ever think that in like a hundred or two hundred years, in the way that we look back 
look back about these people who like primitive timetables, we're going to look back and say, why were there multiple different versions of libc and why were there like multiple oh, yeah. different Linux desktops? Yes. Why, oh yeah. You know, oh yeah. For probably. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think we're, at some point we're going to go. We're going to even do that same thing for times. Like, why didn't they always use Epoch? Yeah, I think so too. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should all use UTC. <laughs> <You're welcome>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about um? When we all jump on um, Elon's BFR and end up on Mars, like how are we going to sync up the podcast then? <laughs> oh my God. You better download yeah, them all before I'm you go. My, my <laughs> but how does the work week work with the different times and the sun rising and yada, 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 yada? How does the tide don't come in and go that. out? <laughs> Tides come in. Can't explain that. Can't explain <laughs> that. We don't know. It just does. <laughs> how do magnets work? <laughs> Freaking crazy if you ask That's me. That's actually Linux. Uh, magnets are Linux powered. It's pretty cool man i like it's yep. he's now flying over the areas that i know like i know these areas that he's flying over right now he's only going a boring 412 Ugh, miles per hour so though. slow mm. Mm. whatever zeus zeus <laughs> right not even breaking the sound barrier <laughs> lame lazy wimpy is so lazy <laughs> it's probably all that telegram that he's doing it's slowing the pl yeah. plane down yeah <laughs> uh so you need to ask him how uh, Thor Ragnarok was and how uh, The Shape of Water was because those are the two films I know he watched on the flight. <laughs> That's the nice thing about a long flight is you can get some movies in which oh, yeah. you don't get to do that while you're driving the RV. Like, oh, I was Not tempted. That attitude. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> I was totally like tempted. I was like, Actually, if, if I'm being completely honest, there was there was a late night where I, I set the phone up on the dashboard and we watched YouTube videos while I drove. But I mostly just listen, mostly. And stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't, you know, because it's, you know, I'm not going to, like, uh, kill myself. But, there, you know, when you're doing something for, like, 12 hours straight, it's like, God, I got to catch up on my shows. <laughs> My YouTube some sort of stimulation. <laughs> My YouTube subscriptions. Do you know uh, I I when um, me and Martin were in um, Seattle a few weeks ago, uh, I signed up for YouTube Red. Oh yeah, and uh, because we don't get it over yeah. here, you, yeah, you oh. over there. Yeah, I yeah. signed up for YouTube Red, and um, so did he, uh, so that I could download a whole bunch of stuff to watch on the flight on the way home. So I watched a load of YouTube videos, and then the second I landed in the UK and I opened YouTube, it was like, nope, you're not having that. Oh, no, really? Oh, you watch stuff that you've downloaded. No, 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 no. Oh, really? Yep. And even now, if when I open a web browser and go to YouTube, the logo in the top left-hand corner shows YouTube Red, and then it immediately changes to YouTube UK. It <sighs> will not let me have wow. YouTube Red. Wow, can't have that. You can't wow. have that. I actually really like it because um, yeah, me too. my kids can be included in the family plan, and so they don't get ads when they go to YouTube, which is nice. I mean, I'm not going to move to the States for it, but it's quite good. <laughs> yeah, why? Well, I mean, that's the thing that I'm always kind of disappointed in both Google and Amazon is when they roll stuff out, it is always just so limited in the... In, it, it's almost always just U.S. only. It's, o it's almost never worldwide. Yeah, right. Uh, and so... Yeah. I know this is it a real takes a while you know, with regulation about that kind of content. Yeah, so. no, I know. Well, That's no, what no, I was no, going to no. say. It's about licensing. They have to get the they have to get the require they have to get the rights from all the yeah. licenses yeah. to make sure that they can do it. I know it's not it's an very, easy problem. It's very different, really, than than iPlayer being yeah. unavailable outside the US. Well, that's kind of understandable, though. Like, because the content really. on there is isn't that subsidized by the people that are paying? Yeah, but it's yeah, still the TV license in exactly the same way. Yeah, it's I would. I could pay. I mean, why not? let us pay for it so we can watch it. Why not? Yeah, why not? That's happening. That's going to come. Is it? Yep. They've already made it so that we have to use an ID to log on to iPlayer. It used to be you could just go to iPlayer and just press play right. and play a, play a thing. But now you have to have a BBC ID in order to log on. And the next step, I mean, I advisedly use the term slippery slope, but it is going down that road. And it will be that people outside the UK could pay and they'll get access to iPlayer. Fantastic. Definitely. That is, yeah, nice. that's nice. Because, I mean, I you know, why not? You know, I mean, that just seems I like mean, they make more money. Yeah. Piracy, really. That was per. It was just in time for Top Gear. Oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. I mean, I mean, with the new Doctor Who, I mean, they should prepare for that. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, like you say, it's going to get pirated. It's just going to get pirated. And yeah, but they the BBC stuff like. Big stuff like Doctor Who. They don't have a lot of big stuff, but the big stuff like Doctor Who and Sherlock, <laughs> they tend to go global on the same day. Is, yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Wait, isn't uh, Victoria BBC and PBS partnership? 
I have no idea. Hmm. Victoria with uh, former former Doctor Who co-star. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, hmm. yes. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Are you? Can I? Can yes. I? Can I confess something? What? You've never watched Doctor Who? No. Really? Not a single. I, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm saving myself. I figure, like, so, if I'm gonna do it, I just gotta I do it. Something? Yeah, go it's ahead. I've watched, I've watched ten minutes of Doctor Who. And I'm bailed. Stand You bailed. Yes. Oh. Which episode? Which episode? Which episode? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it, it, it's it's pretty shit. Really? Um, and <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it is. It, it feels Lonely. like. Is it shit days. like Star Trek: The Original Series? Is kind of yes. campy. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Like that. But I love that. It, no, it feels like it feels like they 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 only. It feels like they got a budget from like 1994, but they only use technology from 1960. Hmm. It's very wait, weird. Wait, is this like the old Who, or are we talking the new? No, all of them. The all, of them. all of it. Yeah. The newer stuff has a bit more CGI and a slightly higher. Yeah, budget, I've seen it, clips it, and I haven't it, been yeah. impressed. Uh, when I, when I watched I mean, it, I, it was, I love it was it, a, and I watch every single episode, and I'll watch them multiple times. See, that's what I feel like but is if I was in the if I was in the right frame of mind, like I had to be in the right frame of mind to watch the original series, and now I love it. I and mean, uh, it's it's a very British thing. It's like tea yes. and the royal family. Like <laughs> you, you, it's one of those things you feel an affinity for, and you feel like you have oh. to defend if well, you're properly British. Funnily <laughs> enough, like my first, doctor, like Red my first. My yeah. first doctor, my first doctor wasn't the new doctor. It was actually uh, Tom Baker, and he's so, a yeah. Tom Baker was my like. So that's the other thing. If you're anywhere between sixty and twenty years old, then you have your own Doctor Who, the one that was the one you watched when you were a kid. And mine <laughs> was Tom Baker, and my brother's was John Pertwee because he was the generation before Tom Baker, and my sisters would have been the one before show, yeah. that. Yeah. That's my favorite doctor is from Epic Rat Battles. <laughs> my favorite uh, doctor is McCoy. From 10 to 4. Dr. Leonard McCoy. I can't <laughs> watch. I can't watch rap battles. Uh, I, 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 I I cringe when I watch rap battles. I just well, I don't know. Know. I mean, it's parody. It is. But this is a joke. obviously parody. Yeah. You, no, stuff. yeah, I know. Yeah, but I still can't watch them. I yeah. just can't watch white people. Well, technically, rap. they're doing a, <laughs> They're on hiatus, though. They're on hi- the uh, both the brothers are on hiatus. Well, not the brothers, but the team is on hiatus in order to do other stuff. You know what? Oh, wow! Look at they're taking a they're taking a significant deviation from their planned course on Wimpy's flight right now. You see that? <laughs> you see that? Uh, it's going in a holding I totally time. knew you were going to say that. You know, uh, like, oh, oh, look, it's uh, it, it really is. Uh, that's something. You know what I got into recently because of my daughter, uh, which I I guess I'm that is the stage we're at now is. Uh, She's really into cooking. That's like kind of like one of the things that over nice. the last year she's kind That's of gotten fun. more and more into. Yeah, it is. It's really fun. And so uh, I got, I just had on a whim, got a whole bunch of uh, Guy's Grocery Games, you know, with Guy Fetter. <laughs> Guy Fieri Fiet- or whatever yeah. his name is. Yeah. She you got the stupid hair. So yeah. you'll be spiking and, and yeah, bleaching and your bleaching, hair. Bleaching, yeah. Soon. She loves that guy's grocery games where the where the people run around the grocery store and they have to get a whole bunch of different items and make these crazy meals in an amount mm-hmm. of time and then they get judged. And she loves it. She picks her person that she wants to win. And so I've been watching on, on the weekends guys grocery games. Uh, join me for diners, drive ins and dives. Yeah, it's triple D's and triple G's. That's yeah. what yeah. That's what but, you know, you guys could little... Have you ever seen Hot Ones on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was on Hot Ones. Yeah, I think I and might have saw that one. I don't know. It was like somehow <laughs> that episode made me respect him for what oh, he does. Oh, really? Because he answers these questions like, why do you wear these ridiculously stupid Hawaiian shirts? shirts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he asked, he answered the question was, they told me to have bring a collared shirt. The only collared shirt I have was that. And then they just thought it was such a great look like, stick that yeah. they kept it and yeah. just forced me to he said, I hate them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was interesting. The other thing the reason why I got the show was during Hurricane Katrina, uh, he brought a bunch of his crew down to just make food for people. And they didn't like bring cameras. They didn't record it and make a show out of it. They just brought their production crew down nice. there, the cooks That's and stuff, really nice. and just made food. And I I was following Katrina news and I just like saw that as one of the items. It just like you know that's a really cool human being thing to do. Yeah, it is. Uh, and he's so, got a bad reputation because of like the way they present him on the shows, but he's actually pretty cool. 
Yeah. Uh, well, except for the whole ridiculous yellow car, every 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 red car, car isn't is it? yellow or something, or and that and it's that hair those, and the those. and the shouting <laughs> and all that. Yeah. <laughs> There's all that. He's like one of the, He's like like. Uh, uh, he's a good I'm, character. Yeah. 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 He is a character. I mean, he could be. But, I mean, he's he can be typified as like the stereotypical uh, American bro. Well, yeah, I, mean, I could see that. My favorite part about on the hot ones is like the very end. He's like. Uh, He's like, I just want to make a point, make it clear. No water, no milk. And then <laughs> they didn't even realize it, and he looks at it and goes, oh, whoa. It's like, yeah. Yep. Have you seen this hot one? He's, so, he's so nonchalant. The only thing he ever said was like, yeah, that's pretty hot. Yeah, wow. so this it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a talk interview show where uh, the guest and the host are constantly eating hotter and hotter and hotter chicken wings wow. as they well, do I mean, the show. It varies by guest, doesn't oh, it? Oh, sorry, I no. tuned out for a bit. What's this program you're talking about? It's I've called seen Hot this. Ones. Hot, Hot Ones, ones yes. on YouTube. I have seen that. I quite <laughs> like that. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Every In between every episode, or every episode, every in between every question, they, they they have to eat a hotter and hotter wing. It's a gimmick, but it make works. their own stuff. That's, yeah, 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 it's actually really good. Like that could similar be a... To that, similar to that, there's a YouTube channel called Brothers Green. Have you seen that? No. It's uh, two brothers uh, who do a lot of cooking stuff and a lot of um, budget huh. cooking, I guess. Okay, yeah, I like that. That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've also been watching Good Mythical Morning just recently. Just oh, started watching yeah. that. Oh. That's fun. Yeah, that's fun. I think the older ones are a little bit uh, more tame than the newer ones. The mm. newer ones are a little bit more... Mm. They push the edge on the newer ones, though. Mm. Chris, do you get uh, Peaky Blinders over there? No. What's this? Gold you way? should uh, you should check out Peaky Blinders. It's um, it's about gangsters uh, set between the t- between the first and the second world war in Birmingham in the UK, and it's really good. If you, oh. if you don't mind a bit of violence and gangsters and stuff, and don't mind that at all. It's sold. it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Peaky, Peaky Blinders, really Hot good. Damn. And I'm told that. The, the accents are not accurate because they had to tame them down so people outside the UK could understand what the fuck they're saying. But it's really, really good. <laughs> nice. I also just, uh, I, uh, I think uh, I think it's called Wild Wild Ones. Have you heard of this? Mm-hmm. Wild Wild Ones is about a cult in Oregon, which is only just a couple of hours from Wes and I are sit where wow. Wes and I sit right now. And it's it's about this charismatic leader who goes off to create a utopian city of like minded individuals, which, funny enough, is an idea that's crossed my mind more than once or twice. Just like Yeah. yeah. So is this Confessions with Chris? <laughs> exactly. That's why when I'm like, and when I'm hearing this, I'm like, so how did it go? How does it? And it and of course, as you would expect, goes really bad. It goes like deep, twisted, dark, kind of bad. And I don't know the details yet, but. I guess they just released a documentary, like a multi-part documentary called Wild Wild Ones, I think, on Netflix. I added it to my list this morning. Speaking of which, have you seen Wild Wild West with Will Smith? (laughs) Yeah. Not the same thing. You see, so I've got all those in front of me right here. There he is. Speaking of Will Smith, did you see that he's a vlogger now? He's vlogging. He's on Instagram and stuff. Really? really Yeah. He's all over the place. What the heck? Yeah. And he's he's trying to match your generation? Uh, What the heck? No, 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 no. no. He's doing it right. Well, take us out. (laughs) Don't don't put us in there if I can't hear him because... (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the Will Smith stuff is actually better because, like, he's not doing the typical no, I'm a huge A right. lister. No, guy. it's legit. He's like, yeah, he's doing it like a regular I person agree. would do it. It yeah. is so, it's so good. And he's he's actually like it's 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 a pretty tight production. It's him and like his personal trainer or something. I don't know who this other guy is. And uh, they're Let's like see the tr- helicopter challenge thing. Uh, uh, I I saw the video where he talked about it and said he's got to wait till after he's doing a video or his yeah, movie. It's yeah, so, yeah it's that so that's the video he's I'm like, thinking yeah, about. I'm do it, and then he's like. Uh, but I'm contractually obligated. Contract. Yeah, <laughs> but like the drone intro, like that all felt like Will Smith going like, "How do I try to do this?" Like it felt like a creative expression. That's what's interesting yeah. about it. It's not just like he's not just sitting there promoing. It's him like actually taking legitimate crack at it. Yeah, he's he's kind of doing like a like a Will Smith Casey combo thing. Yeah. Only he's rich, so like his buddy so can do it better. <laughs> yeah, his buddy crashes a drone in one episode, and they give him a whole hard time for the whole video. And then at the end, like, well, it's Will Smith, so he goes and buys him like a nice uh, new Mavic, and you know, gives it to him. Yeah. So like, it really makes it actually makes it kind of a complete story, 
Yeah, he doesn't try to pretend that he's not rich. He just yeah. he, he doesn't make it the focus like right. a lot of people. Like it's weird because when you get to like this certain level, like even comedians when they get to this massive level, they just start making jokes about being rich. It's like, yeah, no one's no one's not funny. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's you've lost touch. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was surprised. So it's, re- it's really nice to see that he's not yeah. doing that. Yeah, that was my take on it too. And I was I was like, wow, I can't, this is this is really a thing now. This is really a thing. <laughs> And you know what's interesting is the other vloggers that are pretty famous haven't really said anything about it. No. And they're usually all over it, like about collaborating with other vloggers right. and stuff, and it's just sort of been radio silence. I think he's, I think he's in a situation where they they might feel like he's intruding on yeah. their space. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they do. I bet they do. And I, you got to figure he's not going to be the last celebrity to figure this out. That no, I, I, you know, have you seen those, uh, those couple? Those couple of vloggers. If you get any big couple like the doing anything, the, the, any celebrity couple that to do to be like the Osbournes uh-huh. yeah, all over be, again, oh, it'd be crazy. Yeah. Oh man, that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen. Mr. Noah, yeah, how are you doing over there? Are you there? Are you there now? Mr. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah oh, so we, 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 hi, handsome. Only a tiny clip. Hi there. You sound Wait, good. Oh, really? I'm sorry. You yeah, sound I'm good. Sorry. They, Don't bring you us in not, here if you, you can't You would hear not me. believe the amount of effort and technological... Chris has some idea, but the <laughs> amount of effort and technological feed that goes into the show some weeks. What I state are you? Where, where are you? You're in North Dakota, right? You are in yeah, North... Yeah, I'm in North... Yeah, I'm in Grand Forks. You're, I just had to go... I had to go beg, bar and steal another facility because mine's covered in disaster, right? It's just Asbestos disaster. and uh, whatnot. <laughs> really That's bad. terrifying. That sound like a very good color. Wow. No, it's just it's just funny to me. I'm over it now. I was really upset earlier, but it's just it's I'm over it now. But it's just like it's like there are 60 minutes, just 60 little minutes out of the entire week where it's <laughs> a bad idea to, to work in one in one given room. And like yeah. and the thing is, like if they were like, oh, we were running the power today or like something important, I'd be like, oh, okay. They're changing lights. They're changing light fixtures. Uh, like it's like the least important thing they could do. I got some. And they uh, do it on a Tuesday. I got some yard work guys that uh, have some leaf blowers I could send your oh, way. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we should. <laughs> we're watching. As soon as I saw, I was like, "This is a Chris thing." We're yeah, really, really. <laughs> hey Noah, how, what do you do for noise dampening? Do you have like egg cartons everywhere or something? Or yeah, we spend a lot of money. Uh, so there isn't. F- first of all, there is not a flat or round. There's not a flat surface in this room. Like everything has been. It is, it is so that to, to kind of prevent that from from reflecting off. The other thing that we did too is we put a lot of empty space behind me, so the gate can shut off a lot of the room echo and reverb, so you don't hear that. Because you don't want to totally. Nice. I, we tried putting up like uh, like uh, like what Chris did foam everywhere the problem is it was actually too damp like it was to the point where there was no room characteristics at all and then it sounded weird it sounded like almost like i was doing a voice sound like npr chamber yeah yeah right right yeah, yeah. see my solution to that oh. is just to run two mics but control it I mean, my, I, my I solution mean, is absolutely none <laughs> i mean i've seen i've seen a lot of uh, setups from a lot of uh youtubers such as a uh, mr mobile who has his own uh who has his own studio his own uh uh little cabinet room thing where he is uh he does all his voiceover stuff i want to build something like that for wes down in yeah. Seattle, something like a like a like a broadcast box yeah, or that'd something. Yeah, that'd be cool. Micro studs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, micro yeah, studio. They actually, they actually, I think I showed you pictures of it, Chris, when I was when we were in California. But they actually they make a, a like a pre made commercial grade box that you just buy and you just screw the four walls together. Wow. And it's a broadcasting. No, I don't. Booth. I don't think I saw that. That sounds That's awesome. Hilarious. The, yeah, uh, pictures right now. Yeah, yeah. You need something like a cone of silence. You know, do 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 do. Where's the, the sound? I know. I just don't ever use it anymore, so I didn't load it. But that that would really do it. Well, it uses <sighs> particle board apparently. Well, it looks like it uses particle board from what I've seen in, in the Mr. Mobile videos. My method of noise dampening is to get a, a an incredibly uh, crisp, powerful microphone. It's uh, it's called Rock Band. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I thought you were really gonna say wow. that. I thought you actually wow. had something there. Uh, yeah, so tra- tracking Wimpy's flight, it's dropped to 169, 169 miles per hour, and the plane has disappeared. Sorry, not to interrupt, but uh, just like slightly well, I mean, concerned right about now, Wimpy. I'm next to like a right now. I'm next to like one of those like like uh, walls that has like a inc- has like a wall hanging like a cloth. Think of it as a canvas with a cloth over it, but it's like uh, lined the entire wall inside mm. the classroom. 
So that's where I'm at right now, and I'm also using a headset, so... Curtains, you know, help. Curtains can be very effective. Yeah, moving blankets, too, is yep. really helpful. Yeah, right. Ish, 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 ish. I just decide to have a ton of garbage in my room and office, and then that there way, it, everything just... Well, it's not garbage, but, you know, it's stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just sound insulation. Boxes. Garbage works, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, gar well that, that's a little messy, but, like, you know, like, there's a bunch of boxes. There's some extra, like, spare computer parts for no apparent reason I sitting in the floor. I I recommend perfect. using advanced machine learning to uh, adaptively derp. analyze your audio and then derp learn how to correctively and dynamically uh, correct for noise in the background. And yeah. that's okay, exactly so I, what I do. I sent you I sent you some pictures so we can we can try and crash your audio interface because I know how much you love it when that happens. Oh, but, okay. uh, but yeah, no, th what this is, this is actually really fascinating. So uh, we're we're working with the the local university to uh, to to teach the uh, next generation of misguided youth how to do uh, broadcasting. Mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that they have done yeah, that I think is really cool is they have cre they they bought some of these uh, podcasting in a box things and uh, put them on campus for the students to use. So if a, there's a student on campus that wants to start a podcast, um, they have a place to go to record it. So they've even That's built the booth, huh? Snowballs are in there. Yeah. Uh, they're not, actually, so it's funny. You, so they, I asked them about that. I said, you know, what equipment is in there? It's not, it's not like insanely expensive stuff. They're just Mackie boards and, and, uh, and, and, and some basic dynamic mics. So the it's, students yeah. are making podcasts. Nice. Yeah, they want to encourage students because obviously, you know, that's really kind of where the future is, and so they mm -hmm. they want to encourage students to get started. That's I was that's why I thought I showed this to you when I was in California because I was saying they've turned your hobby, uh, a, 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 a industry that you helped pioneer. They've now turned that into a, a major. Like that's you can awesome. Major in podcasting, you know. Jeez, maybe I should go teach. <laughs> yeah. Guest lecturer Fisher. Get an honorary doctorate. The vocal booth recording studio. That's really cool. That is awesome. Good yeah. for them. Good for them. Yeah. Although, yeah, so is, although isn't a uh, major in podcasting a little limiting because technically you, you have multiple skills in some podcasting and you need to work outside of the box and that sort of degree and seems a little things. limiting. Honestly, if you think about it, I mean, we could have an entire discussion about this, but my, my take on stuff like that is always anytime you try to take something like podcast, anything really, and you say, okay, all these people have put in a lot of work, effort, and learned how to do this, and now we're going to condense it down and codify it and put it into a textbook and then teach other people how to do it, it's never going to work. Like, the yeah. people that come graduate with a degree in podcasting uh, are, you know, they could... I they, disagree they, here. But, but also, really? and I, think, I think, just just for a moment, I think that there is one other side. So, the fact that the kids nowadays are looking out to the people doing it and aspiring to do those things, you have sure. to at least have this uh, step or path. See, we always complain, or at least we, we always have looked up for for information, it and it, it was not easy to get started. Chris, was mm. it easy for you to get started? No, 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 of course exactly. not. Exactly. So it is supposed to, you know, there is also this thing of being disappointed, of not having direction. And fortunately, you know, Chris was able to make it, you were able to make it, I'm able to be here with you guys, but yeah. generally speaking, I think the p having that path in school helps out. You know, not having that many broken bones. I agree. I agree. It there, there's the. It's not just pod. I mean, the term podcast means different things to different people, right? For some people, it means like putting an RSS feed out there with audio of people talking to each other, like we're doing. To others, it's making something awesome and putting it on SoundCloud. To other people, it's making a YouTube video. And there are a lot of people below the age of fifteen who see people like PewDiePie and many others. I'm just citing him as is like the guy who makes so much money. I see that as a career option. Whereas when I was a kid making videos and talking about computer games I was playing mm -hmm. was not a thing right. right and now it is a potential yeah. career option and yep. so making a, an educational um you know set of uh, materials that teach people what the tools they need to get um some of the skills they need to learn whether it's lighting camera work you know the green screen stuff all of that kind of stuff nobody would have taught that in school when i was a kid Not and now the competition you know, nowadays yeah to well the other thing to differentiate the other thing too is they to don't segment your content they don't have to be they don't have to leave school and make um you know, like market market crushing uh, shows. I think one of the things that's really going to happen is a lot of businesses, just like a lot of businesses had to have websites at some point, not not mm -hmm. as not as many, but a lot of businesses are going to have to have some sort of 
media presence online, be it a YouTube channel or a podcast or something, um, just yeah. to sort of but get... Also, podcasting is not even that, you know, it's not even that specific. It's it's more of a broad mm. because that that word yep. used to be meaning one individual thing, and it, now it's just, right. it's a it's a global classification. I yeah, I feel like we need to take it back a bit. I feel like we need to take it back a bit. I don't but know. Technically, but, but technically, this is all under audiovisual production. But yeah, okay, I feel like more specifically, let's say, hey, maybe that podcasting wouldn't be that useful. Let me show you my visual arts degree and how amazing that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, not visual arts. This is audio visual, like as like technician or something like that. I'm saying that the visual arts degree is worthless. Mm, yeah, I feel like they, they have to retool it for uh, the kids now, like you know, emphasis on things like Twitch streaming and that and all that sort of stuff because. I mean, all the kids are doing it. Degree. <laughs> yeah. Audio visual but is something should, but... I do for a living, and I've done it for a long time, and I do not have a degree in it. But... Well, there's also, but, but there's also this other factor, I guess, that ends up being here. Yeah. Uh, on, the sense, on the sense of the, the factor being that whenever we're looking at the career path, like oh, nowadays it's considered a sp like playing actual consoles can actually give you credits to get into university. Yeah. <laughs> Because literally, like, it has been classified as a sport, just like chess, which is also a sport, apparently. So, <laughs> yeah, is, you actually can be part of a club of chess and be able to get credits for university because you're, it's like a sport would give you a scholarship under sports. Yeah, yeah but to give false sports. hope to young people in order to get a degree and, and mm. if they don't have the talent to I do don't it. Think it's, I don't think it's false hope when no, I mean, there either. is... You could say that about any any degree that anyone under, has. Under basket weaving. You could, I was you could have that a, when I was in have flight a, school. You could I suppose have a degree that was in campanology I, and there are no churches nearby. You're fucked. I, I guess that was kind of my point is that uh, I think I'm glad that the resource exists and there's a reason that I reached out and I'm offering to volunteer our studio and our time and let those students become a part of yeah, the, that's the nice. program is to, you know, to, that's to, awesome. to get them involved. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I believe in what they're doing. I just, I do have, I do always want to take a step back and say, anytime we just, we set out and say, okay, so this is what you do. You, you plug this box into this thing and you click on this thing and you do this thing. And then that's how you can, you know, you lose the nuance and the, the, yeah, you, you lose the nuance. And the other thing you is can't distill things, it all down. A, there's a real I danger. Don't, I don't think the education, I don't know, but you, you got to start somewhere too, to, at the same time. Right. You, you've got to be going to some kind of yep. crap education establishment. If all they do is prescriptive, press this, press that you're done. Yeah. Here's your certificate. Nobody does that. Like you've got to be able to play to the strengths of the person and, and talk about all the other nuance. I, I, I don't, I don't believe education is like that. Well, and it I might guess, be where you are. I don't know. <laughs> Burn. Maybe. I guess sometimes I just, I could, I get, I become concerned anytime somebody is going to say, this is what podcasting is. And this is how you do it. Don't put podcasting it, in a box. Which that's true for every like that. industry. That is, and you know what's funny about Noah is, is that's what we were just, that's what really the other people are saying with the definition of podcasting is expanding too. It's like you can't keep it in a box because it does oh, come. And, for and, some, well, and look at, there's also the other aspects. Usually they, the of course, includes many, many um, actual classes, class types. You know, you're going to have maybe a little business sense, look marketing at the, sense, all look of those at the things direction that end up that, Look at the direction that you and I have gone through, Chris, just in the last 300, in the last nine months, how things have changed and how dynamic and, and how being dynamic and being willing to be agile and flow and dump an exactly. entire rack full of equipment and go down to an audio yeah. and just being able to try those different things and see what works. I, and I, I worry that gets lost sometimes when we try to codify something and say, this is part of the curriculum and this is how you do it and every student Classic. should do Man, it. Man, I hope so. I, to do exactly the Academy always seems to go the music. proprietary route. I hope so. It'll keep all those sons of bitches anti... It'll keep them off their ball, <laughs> keep me competitive, keep me ahead of everybody. Long live JB. I hope that's exactly what happens. Uh, all right. Well, I should probably clear out to make room for the Ask Nowhere show because we want to get uh, the YouTube stream cleared out so that way... Shut it down. Yeah, we can get it shut down. That way you can get started in time for the show because YouTube needs a couple of minutes <clears throat> to clear itself. So if you're watching on the streams, uh, we're going to break here for a moment. The uh, JBLive.TV stream will go down and the YouTube stream will go down. JB Live stream will come up first and then the YouTube stream will come up a, a moment after that, after Noah and I... So just hang yeah. tight. So thanks, you guys, for I, being I, here. I, I, yeah, I have my I have my checklist ready. So you do. You have a checklist now. Damn. Because otherwise, because here's the problem. Like 
you know, there, you know, just things are changing, and I, I have to be. Uh, <laughs> you gotta be ready. Yeah, you don't want to drop. You don't want to drop the satcom ball. No. Yeah. No. Or any of the other like nine balls that have to get dropped. At exactly <laughs> For some reason, they're all made of glass. That was yeah. our mistake. Yeah, our bad. Didn't think that went through. We just thought it would feel good in the hand. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, those glass-backed phones, son of a. All right, no, I'm gonna uh, kill satcom now, so the YouTube stream will be going down. Okay. And then I'll kill the live stream. <clears throat> I don't know. I'll just chill here. Do you know after we do that?